Do you believe in Jesus? Yes, sir. Well, you're going to meet him. You see what fun this is? It's going to get really exciting. I know what to do now. They've made it clear. You warriors are good. Real good. The best. This is the end of your rotten life, you motherfucking dope pusher. We'd make one hell of a team, Snake. The name is Pliskin. Hey everyone, and welcome to 42nd Street Forever, the official podcast of Grindhouse Cinema Database. My guest on the show today is a cult film cryptid, horror hag, and exploitation film explorer of the dusty and dis- disreputable corners of cinema history. This street preacher of Z- Z-grade cinema can be found at www.midnightmoviemonster.com, as well as on ver- various genre sites and in print publications, or on Twitter and Instagram at Miss Midnight Movie. I'm very happy to have Gigi Graham on this podcast. Hi, Gigi. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's great, great to talk to you. Uh, You know, we've been kind of like talking back and forth on Twitter a little bit here and there. And, you know, we're both big fans of these movies and you're a professional writer. So you've been writing for all different websites and that type of stuff. Yeah, I mean, my work is a lot of a lot of different places. Um, I'll definitely at the end of the show, I'll give kind of more of a rundown of when and where you can find me. But yeah, if it's trash. If it's cult, yep. if it's horror, and it's a place that runs pieces on any of those things, you'll see me eventually. I will come and find it just because I really want people to enjoy these kind of forgotten, disreputable films and realize there is something beyond that binary. People tend to engage with them either as so bad it's good, where it's just like a golden turkey, or right. they'll pick a film, usually like Night of the Living Dead, and that'll be the one you know exploitation low budget kind of transcended its origin film right that is worthy of merit for like most you know even ordinary cinephiles and i just want people to engage with these movies in a way that kind of is a bit more balanced between those two extremes i agree 100 percent because that's like what we've tried to do with our site you know the grando cinema database because we because like when we're if we're fans of these types of movies you don't really look at them as you know, you know, so bad is good. I don't re- I never really looked at them like that. I, that was something that I found found out was going on online, because when I was younger and I watched these movies, I just thought of them as movies. I didn't think of them as like, you know, have some specific category that like that, that they were stuck in. So I completely understand that point of view. You know, it, that's what we do on our site. We, we try to, like, keep everything like a fair balance. So, we you know, when you look at it, you're not judging it by that in that that from that that viewpoint you're just judging it as a movie does it work or does it not work we are so lucky to even have a lot of these films to look at like a lot of them you know the early preservationists and the early pioneers were saving reels out of literal trash bins yep you know things that have been rotting in warehouses forever so the fact right now that we even have a lot of these films to view at all is absolutely amazing so it kind of falls on all of you know, the fans and all of the people to kind of spread the word and kind of keep these things alive because they were so close to disappearing forever. And the best thing we could probably do is, you know, yes, keep people keep aware of them so that maybe they do get those reissues in modern formats. Maybe they do get reevaluated as something other than like curios of a bygone era. And I think the movies that you picked, like we'll get into the movies you picked, but I think a lot of those, that would be, those would be good ones. I mean, I think maybe a couple of them are, have been on Blu-ray, but some other ones haven't, I don't think. And they, you know, I only watched some like older copies, like kind of like, you know, VHS scans or whatever they were, but I think those would benefit some uh, in a nice Blu-ray remaster or something, just so you can see them better. Cause it's, you know, I would absolutely just, you know, love that. Yeah, Cause you're yeah. right. There are yeah. several on the list that are V like, if you can't find a VHS copy. rep, yeah. they're nowhere. Right. And it's tough to do, but I mean, like what you were saying before, just look at the Blu-ray companies and all the stuff they're putting out. I mean, that's kind of t- tells you right there that these movies have, have an audience. And as we know on Twitter, 
you know, everybody's constantly talking about these movies that we love, like, you know what I mean? All from all different types of genres, the horror movies and, you know, everything, black exploitation, all, all, the, all those things. And we get, you know, yeah, every, I mean, every, every subgenre yeah. you know, has a dedicated fan yeah. base at this point. It's yeah. no longer like an isolated interest. And if you look at our like our Blu-ray page, like on our site, I mean, you can see all the different movies that are coming out and they, they've been doing a good job, like, you know, Arrow Video and Shout Factory and all those, you know, the, the more main, I guess they're not mainstream, but, you know, they're more well, maybe more well known than some other ones. But they've done a great job, like on extras and, you know, the remastering and, you know. But I mean, if you look yeah, at we're absolutely spoiled yeah. for choice at this point yeah. with all yeah. of the boutique labels, with these beautiful packages, with extras yeah. and slip covers and right. mini documentaries, like so, it's I mean, a very not, good time to be yeah, an exploitation fan. Yeah, it's awesome. And you can collect all those. And but um, I don't know if you want to get into your list that you you picked. Well, we're going to we're going to before we get into the list proper, I yep. am going to say I'm playing a little fast and loose with definitions here. OK, Um, because some of these only had very limited like. Probably releases or walled yeah. the theater releases yeah. to sweeten their video deals. Some of them were only released overseas. Yeah. Some of them were in a theater so quickly. If you blinked, you probably missed it, mm-hmm. but they are all clearly exploitation films from roughly the golden age of same. There's one movie the, this... that is from 62, but everything okay. else is between 65 and 85, mm-hmm. which I yep. think most people would agree is the golden era for exploitation. Yep. So don't at me about that, please. <laughs> don't at me. <laughs> I'm don't aware. Complain. Please do not at me on Twitter or Instagram. <laughs> yep. And these are not in any particular order. They're not ranked in any way. Just going to run down alphabetical. Okay. They're just 10 of my favorite movies that I think are underseen and under discussed. There's a couple yep. of other films that missed this cut. Um, this is a question that if you ask me on any given day, I could give you a fresh list of 10 different movies, but Today, in this moment, this is 10 movies that I feel are underseen and underappreciated in terms of all subgenres of exploitation. That's great. Sounds great. And uh, I was wondering, what what are your favorite genres overall of like, ex, you know, exploitation? You, you just like everything. I mean, you must have like we all have sort of our little favorites that we like more than others. But uh, let's see. It's kind of hard to call it. Yeah. I kind of get into these yeah. weird, like my favorites are these weird subgenres I've kind of invented in my own head, like oh, super yeah. downbeat sexploitation movies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> cool. um, <laughs> you know, super downbeat sexploitation movies, um, yeah. you know, stylish Euro sleaze, like things <laughs> that I kind of make up. Like That's pretty cool, though. That's that's neat that you have your own little, you know, your own categories that you make up. Yeah, I have my own little classification system. Like that's I can neat. usually tell if something's going to be for me. I love right. um, tiny regional horror productions. Oh, yeah. Like what little would be a good regional yeah. films? Adore it. Yeah. Like, well, one of the one of the ones on your list, could, so I guess, would be sort of like that. But, you know, yes. I'm not sure. I think I did include know. one. Yeah. OK. So, well, anyways, but yeah, that's really cool that you have your like little genres that you make up subgenres and stuff. Yeah, but, I uh, kind of have my own weird classifications. <laughs> um, if you cool. follow me on social media, you're used yep. to like, oh, she found another like really depressing sex movie again. Here we go. <laughs> now we're going to have to hear sex. about this for the Nothing next like two depressing months. sex movies to bring up, you know, <laughs> pick up your day. <laughs> Well, it's yeah. just, I always liked the concept being that if you were going to watch a sex film, you had to go to a theater to do it. Oh, yeah, so yeah. Obviously, there's a very specific purpose if you're in an adult theater. But <laughs> if you're, if you go to the adult theater and you see something like Flesh Pot on 42nd Street. Yeah. What do you do with that? <laughs> I don't How know. How does it's... that mess up your head? How does that mess <laughs> up your home? <laughs> I don't know. It's like it's strange because. No, from me, I just I was, you know, too young for it to go to the theaters to see porno movies. I was like, you know, I grew up in the 80s. So everything I saw was on VHS. So that's where I first got in, you know, first saw all that type of stuff. But, but yeah, I don't yeah, know. I, I never I never really thought about that. But anyways, I just saw. Yeah. It like if you're, whatever. you know, going just to see a lighthearted movie and you end up yeah. with like Fresh Pot on 42nd yeah. Street or Abigail <laughs> Leslie's back in town. Yeah. Like, what did you do with that? Did that just ruin the rest of your day? I don't know what the hell they did, but. <laughs> That's a weird. I never really thought about that one, but <laughs> yeah, that is weird. <laughs> but um. But in any case, yeah. before I digress into fifteen your other topics, <laughs> let's get into this list, shall we? Um, yep. the Very yep. first film is Baba Yaga, it's directed oh, yeah. by Corrado Farina, and it was released in 1973. Okay. Um, this film is an adaptation of a one arc of a long-running series of erotic comics by an Italian artist named Guido Kripox. Um, Unfortunately, most of the Valentina series hasn't been translated to English and what is, 
um, is out of print as far as I know. But in any case, it is a adaptation from that comic book, which is in and of itself a very loose adaptation of the Eastern European folklore. Um, okay. The films Baba Yaga and the actual story, the actual myths Baba Yaga, the only thing they have in common is that they're older women and they're witches. And the house okay. kind of moves around a little bit. But in the case of the film, it doesn't have chicken feet. <laughs> um. <laughs> That's funny. Uh yeah. So, I mean, this one was, you know, I, I was trying to get I, I noticed Carol Baker was the star of it. And I was like looking up her her filmography and I noticed that she was in like movies like when I was growing up, I saw her in kindergarten cop. Not this is like connect, not the, this is connected to the movie, but it's like I, at the time I didn't know like this was when I was a kid. So I didn't know like her past in movies. But the, like the, the, it's funny that she would do like all those Italian genre films and then like, you know, she'd show up in like kindergarten cop it's just weird well, you know she I mean? came it's from weird, hollywood you know I mean? originally okay she oh, yeah, was yeah. a starlet for a quick moment and what? she starred in things like baby doll oh yeah i was gonna i just that's what i was gonna say baby doll. right baby doll i just looked that up and i noticed that but that's yeah you're right yeah yeah but i mean it was yeah, just so interesting when she, she went got over to a Italy little bit and, yeah. long in the tooth i guess for that era's hollywood yeah. Like a lot of people did, she started making genre films overseas. And when that stopped working out for her, she came back and did character parts in the US. Like Carol Baker had a fairly long career. And That's pretty good. I think she, is she still around now? I, I'm not sure. I, I looked up I'm her. not sure if she's yeah. still living. I would have to double check, but yeah. she did have a substantial career. Um, yep. She actually wasn't the first choice for this. The production on this film was pretty troubled. Yep. Um, there was a lot of recasting. There was a lot of recutting. There was also mm. some pretty extensive rewrites to the script, mm -hmm. um, which adds some characters and composites, some characters that aren't necessarily in the source material. Right. Um, the reason why I love this particular film is it has got so much style to it. It is absolutely yeah. visually beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, the plot is a little bit confusing because it toys with some giallo conventions. It toys with like a supernatural horror. There's a very queer coded, like very homoerotic connection between Baba Yaga and a young fashion photographer named Valentina that she's trying to possess. Right. Yep. And there's a very resonant groove in how she chooses to do yeah. that. But yep. that leaves the film kind of neither here nor there for a lot of people. In terms yeah, of genre, because it's, it's not quite a sex movie. It's not, it's not quite playing a by movie. any. It's not like sticking to one genre. It's like kind of just kind of blending a bunch of different things. And it doesn't. So that that makes it kind of like you don't know what to feel out of it. You know what I mean? That type of thing. I think that's yeah, probably what I thought I about don't it think too. knew what to do yeah. with it. Yeah, um, that's what I think I felt too. And they retitled it multiple times trying yeah. to get it to work. Um, yeah. Kiss me, kill me. The yeah. Devil Witch, trying to oh. give it, you know, alternate titles that maybe more firmly placed it in a specific genre. Or in horror or whatever it would be. Yeah. Or, yeah. Right. But, yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah. On a so sheer, it's one of those films. Yeah, it's one of it's kind of one of those things that suffers. Like a lot of horror comedies have the same problem where they're not scary enough to be truly horror movies, but they're right. not funny enough to be. <laughs> Yeah, they're like just kind of like <laughs> they're kind of walking the line. This is not quite enough line. of a horror movie to really, you know, right? It, of course, kind of straddles a bunch of genres. Which, to be fair, the source material comic book mm -hmm. um, hops through a lot of conventions. Oh, yeah. It was very long running, and it started out as more of like a traditional comic. Then it moved into more sci-fi. Then it got more psychosexual. So this oh, could wow. be um, a bit of a lift from the source material. I see. But on a purely visual level, yeah, the film it's really is good. Absolutely stunning. Yeah, it's it is a beautiful looking film. And I think that's probably what I what I overall, that's probably what I liked most about it, because like you were saying, like all the different genre stuff, it didn't really it just kind of went all over the place. But yeah, I really liked that. And what was that was the, the girl Valentina, the girl that played her? Was she in any any other movies that we know? Like um, she Isabel was in Defuenes? some very minor yeah. films, as I yeah. recall. She was okay. primarily a model and a singer, Isabel yeah. Defuenes. Yeah. And yeah. she didn't have a long career as an actress because I don't think it was a huge priority for her. Mm -hmm. um, she's perfectly cast in this and they actually transition okay. in a couple of shots from Guido Kripax's drawings to her face. Oh, yeah. oh and that's it's really identical. cool. I didn't even know that. That's, that's yeah. really cool. Yeah. The black and white drawings that are interspersed, the panels that are interspersed. Those are, are from the com the original. Yeah, comic. those are his actual okay. drawings. I don't know if they were made specifically for the film or if they were lifted directly from the comic book. Oh, wow. But um, this film, probably better than any other film I've ever seen, 
in -hmm. terms of getting the sequential nature of like comic art. Oh yeah. That's that's awesome. This does an extremely good job. It'll fade from illustrations to, you know, what's going on in the film. And there's some interesting use of color gels and processing to right. kind of give it that like traditional panel by panel look. Yeah, that looks that's awesome. And and it doesn't like ruin the, you know, the overall effect like it kind of does it in a, like a nice artful way, a nice artistic way. Yeah, this is a Just very the, arty film. Yeah. I usually sell it to people if you like Daughters of Darkness, which oh, yeah. is also very stylized. That. Yeah, I, I think I was going to watch that last month but i missed i did i just didn't get to it or something but I, i've heard of it that's that just came out on blu-ray i think and it's like did good well just been reissued because it's yeah. been out on Blu-ray. okay uh, okay um not something the, weird blue underground yeah. blue underground had that out for yeah. quite a while okay i see and uh who um, else was in this george eastman i've seen him in a george lot of movies eastman, yeah. who i only ever think of from arthropophagus yeah and i think he was in um George, I'm tra- yeah, that's right. And, that, and he was also in um, one of my favorite, um, you know, crime movies, Italian crime movies. He was in Kidnapped or Rabid Dogs. He's he one was of the in guys quite in a movie. few films. He's yeah, he's in tons not, of stuff back then. Not yeah. super great in any of them. He was kind of like your <laughs> perfectly kind of, blank square jawed guy. Yeah, right. And I, he's probably in a bunch of like spaghetti westerns, too, but I can't name any off offhand. But yeah, he, he wasn't like, you know, it, he didn't have like a specific, really cool, like personality or anything like a lot, like some of those. No, people he was that, just, you know, if you need like a square jawed, competent, big, a big, dude, and wasn't he like a huge guy? Again. Wasn't he like a huge guy, huge, tall guy? I think I'm not sure because yeah. you can't see yeah. him like his yeah. shots in this film. He's yeah. not really shot in the same frame with anyone else too often when he's yeah. not like sitting down. Yeah, because I remember in the, the in Rabid Dogs or Kidnapped, he's like he seems like he's like seven feet tall. I don't know how tall he was, but he was like freaking huge. <laughs> but uh, um, anyway. I'm going to just caveat this. with <laughs> I hate his character in this movie. His character in this movie is so incredibly useless. And they added him in for the film. And I wish they hadn't. Yeah. You, you just wanted it to be the two the two women or something, right? Yeah. More I like mean, that. basically, because everything interesting that happens happens between them. He just yeah, comes right. around to be like, she couldn't possibly mm-hmm. be a witch. None of it's this is like, happening. Yeah. It's not like a very good. It's not a good addition to the story. Yeah. Oh, the creepy yeah. bondage doll she gave you is pretty hot. <laughs> if she comes to life, call me. Like he's useless. <laughs> call me. <laughs> he literally it comes to life. Call actual me. dialogue from the film. <laughs> That's funny. And the doll does come to life um, as a Playboy playmate. Oh, nice. Uh, I believe her name is Ellie Galliani. Oh, yeah. And she was in she was in she was in the other movie. She was in that other movie we watched. I think she was in. Wasn't she in check to the queen? She was in that. She was the girl in that whatever her name was. No, no. The main girl in that when we get to that. No, I'm saying the. I thought, well, who who was the the other girl, the girl with the blonde hair and in check to the queen? I thought that was her. Politoff. They have similar faces, but they're not. Okay, I must have. Okay, I made a mistake on that. (laughs) Okay, but yeah. So much. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> if you like Daughters of Darkness, that kind of yep. art house meets grindhouse, very queer coded, yeah. um, you know, kind of push pull action reaction struggle yep. between women. This right. is kind of the cool blue, cool jazz, like cousin yep. oh, of yeah. that film's like blood red, you know, mm-hmm. glittering stylization. So if you yeah. like that, you might also like this. Both are kind yeah. of perfect for late nights, altered states, you know, the end of a long yeah. movie marathon at two in the morning on a slightly. They're kind of like where you're like, you don't, you don't, you don't know what the hell is going on. You're just like, <laughs> and you don't like necessarily psychedelic need to, stuff. It's yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. It's just like a psychedelic type weird. All right. Number two in this little guided tour to, you know, forgotten films. Yep. The Baron from 1977 um, directed right. by Philip Fenty. I was going to say, I'm not sure uh, ever had a theatrical release. I've only ever seen it with a video cover. I've never seen a theatrical poster for it. I can't find any evidence of that happening. This might have gone direct to video. This may have gone direct to video, or it may have had such a small release that even the newspaper ads basically missed it. Yeah, that was one of those where it's like I the way I looked at it was was if those if if the movie didn't have like a cool poster and like a cool like promotional campaign, then it's it probably didn't really do very much because, you know, it's it's sort of like it's I mean, it's not really black exploit. It's one of those movies where it's not it's kind of like it is and it's it's not it, it doesn't have like that real, you know, bold type of character. And it's it's sort of like almost like a um like more of a mainstream film. I don't, I don't know how to describe that one. It, it's, um, it's not this is you know definitely I mean? not, black exploitation adjacent. Yeah, I mean, it's just you, not. You have yeah. a disenfranchised character yeah. who has to kind of 
contend with criminals and the underworld, yeah. but it's but in it, a very different context. Um, right. This movie mm, actually yeah. has a really great cast. It has it does, stars yeah. Calvin Lockhart from Cotton Comes to Harlem. Let's do it yep. again. He had a very long career in film. Marlene um, Clark. Marlene Clark yep. from Ganja and Hess. Yep. Who I think is one of the most she was in a ton of stuff. actresses of the Grindhouse. house. And there. they were both in one of my favorites, The Beast, The Beast Must Die. That's one of my favorite horror movies, black exploitation horror movies. They were both in that. Yeah, that's were awesome. They? Yeah, they, they were. Yeah. That? Yep. He, he was the star. They were both stars. And she I don't want to ruin the, you know, the what happens in the movie. But <laughs> For anyone anyways, who hasn't seen <laughs> yeah, that's that's when I just watched that. Redacted, I, redacted, redacted. Yeah, I usually watch that every year, every year for the the horror thon thing, you know, the horror horror month i use that's one of my favorites so yeah that was that was a cool little thing that they're both in it and i also noticed that charles mcgregor was in it and he's he's been in he was in superfly which the director wrote yes philip, philip fenty you probably were going to say that but i thought i'd bring that yeah, up he I did love write that movie. superfly and this actually yeah. comes into play okay. in the film itself yep because i feel like more than anything this is a movie about how hard it was to get these kind of in independent productions. Made. Yeah, that's a, actually a cool, that's kind of a cool thing to, it's because almost like about that character, story. Yeah. You know, he has a concept that everyone loves. Baron Wolfgang von Trips. It's like family <laughs> friendly, like race car driver, like fantasy adventure. Like everyone Snoop, loves the concept. Him. Yeah, the, the Snoopy, the Red Baron, it kind of reminds, he reminded me of that yes, for some reason um, too. The styling is very yeah. much the Red Baron. <laughs> yeah, it was like, just like that. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. And Which may have point. given the film its title. You know, I can't yep. say for sure. Right. Um, and while everyone loves the idea, anyone who might want to finance this movie is saying you have to replace your all black cast with a white one. Yep. And given that this is made by people who were involved in the production of one of the biggest independent hits that was also focused on black stars yep. that was ever produced. I can't help but think they're putting a little bit of themselves and their experiences and the trouble they had getting that film made the way they wanted to make it. That's an and awesome like aspect. Yeah, that's an awesome when, aspect. I didn't know, think about that either. When kind of Grindhouse and independent exploitation kind of gets a bit meta and a bit reflexive, like um, Starlet from the late mm -hmm. 60s is a little bit of a meta commentary. Hollywood Boulevard with Candace oh, yeah. Rielsen. Yep. kind of trods that same territory of how much of a crazy slog it was to get these movies made. Right. And also it, it remind, this one reminded me of one of my favorites, Hollywood Man, which I don't know if you've seen that one with William Smith, but it's sort of not. the same. Yeah, it's sort of the same story. He's trying to get his movie made and like he goes to like mobsters. It's sort of the same set of you. It would actually be probably like a good double feature. I thought Hollywood. Yeah, Man that would actually Barrett. be an excellent. You, kind you'd of probably like feature. that one, too. Yeah, that was one of my favorites. So this one kind of reminded me of that. Although I, I mean, I like this this film, The Baron, but I don't. I still like Hollywood Man a little bit more because I'm more. Well, you, you know how I love like real black exploitation films more than you know what I mean. This one was sort of like it wasn't like it was more of just like a real story of type thing in a way. You know what I mean? It wasn't like you know crazy. Yeah, there like wasn't those exaggerated super, superheroes you know, he and stuff. Ever yeah. become? Yeah, it's like a superhero. Or, yeah, right, right. You know, he's yeah. not like super action packed. Like, yeah, there right. are criminals involved. There's the mob yeah. involved, but he's yeah. not like some superhuman yeah, superhero look, taking right. vengeance for all sorts of um, yeah. societal and contextual injustices or anything. Yeah. And I, it's like weird because like they probably could have like say if they had like re re like gave it like a different spin, like in the promotional thing, they could have made like, you know, the Baron like sounds almost sounds like kind of like a super fly type character. So they could have done that. And made like a real cool, you know, promotional campaign and stuff. But I guess they didn't do that. Or they well, I mean, even if they did, whatever. it probably yeah. would have had the same problem. Because if yeah. you go into this expecting your traditional, yeah, right, right. you know, black exploitation movie, you're yeah, going to be very true. disappointed. Right, but if you true. go into it looking at it as like kind of a love letter and a frustration, like both a yeah. love letter and a frustrated snarl right. at what it takes to get an independent film made. Right. It's actually a lot of fun. And I mean, the caliber of actors in this one is actually quite good. Visually, and, yeah. it's not a particularly pretty film, but I mean, yeah. Calvin Lockhart had a long career. Richard Lynch is one of your prim primary antagonists, and he's yeah. fantastic as just an absolute scumbag. And he, yeah, he is. And I saw him in the Seven Ups. People have probably seen these movies, Seven Ups. And I think he was in Inv Invasion USA. That's probably where I first saw him in he's the, the Chuck Norris movie. But movies. he always he's plays like bad guys. I yeah, think he was like, he's a yeah. longtime character actor. Yeah, he was really good. Definitely. Um, Marlene Clark, which, as I said, is one of the most beautiful yeah. and talented. Like she always was underutilized. The only role yeah. I can think of she had that was really worthy of her was as yeah. in Ganja and Hess. 
Yeah, she was she was one of my favorites from back then, too. Yeah. And then we have Joan Blondell, who was a huge Hollywood star in the 30s and, you know, early 40s. Mm -hmm. And here she is an old dowager who hires our main (laughs) character as her gigolo. And she's having such a great time, having such a good time camping it up. I love it. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, that's that's that that was the good character. And um, it was very it's it's very silly. It's very over the top. But yeah, if you like the rich white lady. (laughs) Yeah, that's then you'll probably like this. And Raymond St. Jacques, did you uh, we mentioned him? He was in Cotton Comes to Harlem and the you know uh what do you call it uh the the follow-up um comeback charleston blue i think he was that guy no we hadn't yeah, mentioned raymond him, so we won't leave him out yep yeah but th- this was this was one of those movies for me like i like i you know i i now that you just you explain like where you were coming from with it and your your thoughts on it that's i mean that makes it better for me but i you know overall it's not my it wasn't really you know i did like it but it wasn't like i i think i like the more traditional you know, like black exploitation type films more than this one. But I, it was good, though, for that type of story. Definitely good. It's too bad that like it. And also the, the print I saw wasn't great. So, I mean, I, I think a lot this of is times another one, yeah, like if somebody yeah. wants to restore this, could we please? It would be nice we because I think it would help it. I think it would help. Like, you know what I mean? It would make it better, easy to watch and not be so like kind of muddled and stuff. You know what I mean? Like some of the some of the scenes were like kind of too dark and that type of stuff because the print was so bad. But. Yeah, because I think this oh, yeah. is another one that's been languishing yeah. basically on VHS. Right. The- so it, it would be good to have like a nice remastered version of that. But I don't know. if Speaking of languishing on VHS, yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> the next movie on this list yeah. is probably the one that I would be most thrilled if someone decides to, you know, update it to a modern yeah. format. Yeah. It's called The Black Room. Depending on where you look, the release date for this is listed as anywhere between 82 and 85. Um, Mm -hmm. because it had quite the checkered release history. I'm going to split the difference and say 83. Yep. Um, And it's Norman Thaddeus Bain and Ellie Kenner were co-directors on this. Mm -hmm. Norman Thaddeus Bain, I think most people recognize from the movie Frightmare. Oh, yeah. That's probably the best known thing that that he directed. Yep. And, uh, you know, I, yeah, I was going to, what was I going to say? Yeah, I was watching this movie and and this is one of the ones I liked the most out of the list. Like, you know, I really love this one a lot. I just thought that the story was so weird, you know, the, the plot, the plot of it, it was just like, I, I didn't, I don't think I even expected it. I thought it was going to be something else, but it turned out to be, you know, I'll let, I'll let you go on and describe what it's, what it was, but. Um, I mean, <laughs> the plot here is deceptively simple. Yeah. You have a husband and wife, they've been together a good while. They have some kids, their relationship is kind of uh, flagging, dragging a little bit. They're not like really balancing work and parenthood and some other things very well. Yep. So really- the husband rents a black room, an actual black room, <laughs> as advertised on the tin in the Hollywood Hills to have his affairs in, basically, to have his one night stands in. Mm-hmm. And the brother and sister that own the house are not exactly what they appear to be. And his wife eventually gets wind of his extracurricular activities. And rather than, you know, do the typical melodrama sort of thing and leave him. She uh, decides she's going to have some adventures of her own. And this is kind of an atypical plot for the kind of movie that it is, because while it's very sexual, there's a lot of sex in it. This is definitely not um, trying to be porn or trying to be titillating necessarily. Mm -hmm. If anything, this is kind of an exploration of how if you go into like polyamory or swinging for the wrong reasons, how it will just lead yeah. to heightened jealousies and resentments. And if anybody here has the book Nightmare USA, Stephen Thrower actually interviewed yeah. the director and he was a swinger. He had lived oh a lot God. of this, which is why the dynamics Weird. of the husband is fine when it's him, you know, banging random college girls in his like. But he gets pissed off when his wife does when it. When the wife so it's does like, it. Yeah. There's no free love for her. She can, she, she can't do it, but he can. Yeah. She so can't it's do weird. It. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's it strange. You know, he's a man. And yeah. to be honest with you, she's definitely the more sympathetic character. Yeah. Sympathetic she character. Al- she almost seems, yeah. She almost seems like she's doing it just to kind of like get back at him or something. She's not like really doing as she wants to, to do it so much. Well, I think I it's also like yeah. she wants to do kinky things yeah. and she wants to like do all the fun so, yeah, stuff yeah. with him and yeah. he keeps, he doesn't want to do it. So he's like, fine. yeah, I guess that's so, what it is. Yeah. 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 She's like, fine. I'll just find some pretty young yeah. boys. Okay. Yeah. Try that's and right. Stop me. 
<laughs> so, and I also noticed, yeah, I mean, I really like this one. This is now, this is one I wish like I could see like in a nice, beautiful print, like a nice, you yes, know, what I mean? nice clear, there's actually that would be, cool. that would help this. I think this movie. Yeah. There's actually yeah. some really cool, like arty, almost music video style stuff in terms of the sex yeah. scenes that yeah. would look beautiful and a cleaned up. Yeah, I think it really it's would. Very dark. It's yeah, it very is. Muddy. Real- the bl- hence the black room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just it's one of those things. Black. It is really. And it's, I was watching this movie and th- through, through all of these movies, some things happen. Like I'd be watching it and I'd, I'd go, who is that guy? I know him from somewhere. And this it happened in this movie. So I was watching and I was like, was that who I thought it was? And it turned out to be Chris McDonald, who we know from like happy Gilmore. People yes. know who he is. What's his name? Uh, Shooter McGavin or something Scooter like that. McGav- yeah. Sco- but uh, yeah. So Chris McDonald was in this and I was like, you know, that's, and that happened a few times in these movies. I kept seeing like spotting people like that. Like th- this must have been like their first movie or something like these yeah. movies way back then. Yeah. And it's yeah. not much of a part. He's a yeah. He's just a little like, you know, he likes to watch other people have sex with his girlfriend yeah, for really research a... purposes. That's yeah. his story. And he's sticking to it. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Like whatever. <laughs> yeah. Sure, guys. Purposes, that's whatever what you is. say. It's, it's, your, it's your college paper, buddy. That's okay. funny. That, that was funny that he said that. I thought that was I laughed at that part. I just like to watch it because, you know, it's, I'm doing research for my paper or something. Yeah, <laughs> that was I, I'm just watching for my. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, bud. That was funny stuff. But yeah, this yeah, this movie was really, really interesting. I just really liked it because I don't think I've ever seen any that story before. Like, you know, I, I mean, like you were saying, like that, that's a standard thing. The the main part, but then like the other part with like the the blood transfusions. I never saw that before. Like, you know, they're holding people like, you know, killing people for blood transfusion that but you know what it reminded me of was ganja and hess it kind of like i thought this would be a good one good double feature with ganja and hess because that sort of like had blood stuff yeah, to well, do with getting they blood and kind stuff. of are yeah. dealing with sex and kind of, of the flesh yeah, and yeah it's sort of that idea. metaphor of blood being tainted in a in a metaphor of vampirism like you know that type of stuff it's like or, or addiction kind of like the metaphor for addiction i think that's what i was going to say in the other show it's like, you yeah, know, that, like the, the, it's the definitely blood. you could yeah, yeah. because they both kind of take the idea of vampirism in yeah. very divergent ways. Yeah. Um, also, in terms of the more overt genre imagery in the black mm-hmm. room, when there is the reveal of what the brother and sister are up to, because mm-hmm. we're dealing with blood transfusions and needles mm-hmm. and kind of the filth of the flesh and mm-hmm. the decay of the flesh in that process. Yeah. Yep. Um, there are some people who take this as a bit of also a possible metaphor. AIDS or probably something? Probably accidental yeah. given yeah. the timing for the yeah. AIDS epidemic. Yeah, I, I don't know really necessarily that if the filmmakers were thinking it through that far, but it's definitely yeah. there if you want to see it. Like the era of free love and the era right. of, you know, everybody kind right. of living for today and not for tomorrow because they had yeah. nothing to fear was ending. Right. That's that's a that's another good aspect of the movie, too. I never I didn't really, you know, because when I was watching, I wasn't thinking of that. Obviously, I, it's one of those things that will come up in a conversation and you go, oh, aha, I get I get that now. But like, you know, that's that's, that's an interesting aspect I didn't think of. Another. Yeah, little I mean, detail. you definitely could read it as a metaphor yeah. for like yeah. the end of people kind of being innocent. Right. In right. terms of sexual safety and sexual freedom and, yep. you know, in the seventies, everybody was sleeping with everybody. And I don't mm-hmm. think anybody was too worried about it. And the AIDS right. epidemic kind of put an end to that. Right. Yeah, sure. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, so that, and that's like a horror I think the thing. Filmmakers necessarily thought it that far through. Not really, but it's there, you know, sometimes, you know, a million monkeys with a million typewriters, one of them will hit Shakespeare and sometimes, and I, you know, a million yeah. trash movies from a million indie directors. One of them will right. hit on something that's oddly, um, that seems to foretell a little bit of what's coming in the real world. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah. I like, and I love those, that type of stuff, when that stuff type of stuff happens in movies, but then I think sometimes other, another, another weird thing that happens is like someone will be writing about something as it's happening and they might not even know what's happening, but it's sort of like somehow it like they connect with that, that thing. And, and like, they'll, they'll re they'll watch it later on. They'll say, you know, that, that kind of connected with that. I didn't even know about it. Like maybe like, like the pandemic now, someone was like writing about something in that, in that type of story. And then, then it happened and it almost like, it was like almost like a pre, uh, what do you call it? A, um, like a, um, that kind of collective unconscious moment where you couldn't have known, but maybe you do predetermined or whatever predicted something that, yeah, depending on how superstitious you want to be about it. Yeah. I guess it just depends Um, on what it is, but yeah, but I really, this is one of the ones I liked. uh, the most out of the list out of, out of your list. I absolutely yeah. love this movie. Yeah. Um, I absolutely recommend mm-hmm. track it down if you possibly can. Yeah. Um, and, 
And one of the reasons why I love it is because mm-hmm. it never specifically punishes the couple for wanting to be sexually adventurous. Right. What ends up being yep. their undoing and ends up causing a lot of their problems is the husband has this Madonna whore complex to beat the band and the wife yep. is given up communicating with her husband. Yeah. So not, it has that aspect. Yeah. Like most John, like, especially when you get into things like slashers, there's mm-hmm. a very like sex negative type of attitude. Like if you whoever has sex is going to get killed type stuff. Yes. <laughs> Whereas yep. this movie is not interested in punishing them for their desires. It's interested in punishing them for the fact that they are doing a terrible job communicating with each other. And yeah, kind that's of really interesting. Their own issues. Yeah, that's really cool. That's an interesting aspect, too. Really cool. Yeah, I, I like this one a lot. That was one, a really good one. So I hope if ever, anyone listens to this, I hope like they'll put it out on Blu-ray or something. Skip, yes, skip, if skip that other junk that we don't want. <laughs> at any of the boutique yeah. labels, here's this. Yeah. Black Room, please. Yeah, that's the one we want. That's the one I, yeah. I want to see. I don't want to see those other, like the other 50 All that I I'm never going to want. All I want for Christmas is, you know, this obscure <laughs> the black film room, A Black Room box set with like, you know, <laughs> two, two discs full of extras and stuff. <laughs> yeah, I just love that one. And that, who directed that? That was uh, Norman Thaddeus Bain. Yeah, and, yes, dri- and Ellie yeah. Kenner. And I think I did see Fright Mayor. I think I saw that one. Yeah, that was I a really that's weird probably movie. Probably his best known film. Yeah, I, I remember seeing that. That was a really weird movie. I can't remember the. I watched it last, not this year, but the, the last year for the horror thing. And I was like, what the? Heck? This was crazy. Is that the one that that uh, I think Tom Savini worked on it? I think. And it was I'm like from sure 1981. I think. The yeah. supervisor. I think it was him. Maybe maybe it was a different. Yeah, but um, yeah. So definitely, the Black Room is one of our, our favorites on the list. Yes. You want to go on to the now, next one? Because we <laughs> we did just we did kind of touch on yeah. my love for like shaggy, hyper regional, super low budget movies. Yep. Speaking of next movie yep. on this list is Keep My Grave Open by oh, SF yeah. Brown Rig. Yeah. Um, I have to shout out um the editor in chief of Drive in Asylum, Bill Van Ren, okay. because he okay. is a huge SF Brown Rig person and he <laughs> SF Brown was the person yeah. who introduced me to this particular film of his. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's and awesome. was like, you know, no matter how you feel about his other films, you have to watch this. And he you know, was right, yeah. because out of Brown Rigg's entire catalog, mm-hmm. this is probably the film I like of his the best. You know, you know, and I looked up his stuff and I, I when I saw the name, I knew the name, but I couldn't remember exactly what it was. So I looked it up. It was, he did Scum of the Earth, that movie, but I haven't Which seen is- it. I haven't seen it yet because I think Grind- Grindhouse Releasing have yeah, it on Grindhouse their schedule. Grindhouse Releasing announced it quite a but while they have, ago. They never, re- never released it. So I've been waiting to try to see that movie and I never have. I haven't seen it yet. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm hoping they actually put it out. Like, obviously, mm-hmm. rest in peace, um, right. stay, um, Stage yeah. alone, because I think mm-hmm. that might have kind of, you know, yeah. greatly reduced their plans because it was just the two mm-hmm. of them that were running Grindhouse Releasing. Right. So, I mean hopefully at some point they put it out i know they yeah, did I announce do. it yep um i think people probably know him better for his don't films don't look in the basement um, oh yeah don't like, look in the basement don't open the door yeah i don't think i i'm trying to think if i've seen don't look in the basement i might have seen that one like during one of the horror marathons but i don't really remember it i guess i maybe i didn't like it so much or something but i like i did like keep my grave open though that was an interesting film um, this is kind of down in the dirt Polanski <laughs> territory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really if you weird. You wanted to make like repulsion you know, or something. Kind of woman goes crazy. Yeah, repulsion. Horror. Yeah, it reminded me of repulsion a little bit. Yeah, because we have a very wealthy young woman who lives in like an isolated ranch with her brother, mm-hmm. and you never actually see her brother. Um, he's supposedly he's in his room. He's Kevin. Sick, he's Where is Kevin? <laughs> yeah. Where are you, Kevin? <laughs> Kevin, won't you so come weird. in here? <laughs> I thought yeah, that was and, like, I mean, that's all well and good. It's all harmless eccentricity until bodies start showing up on her ranch. Right. And I and I and, I, I was watching the very beginning of the movie and I was like laughing because it was like some guy like it wasn't like a hobo and he just like shows up. He's like, Is anybody home? And he just goes in the house and starts like raiding the fridge or something. I, I yes. it was just funny. <laughs> I was laughing at that part. That was like, no, was there like are parts of this that are definitely low budget and very silly. Yeah. It was but very I do funny. think um your lead actress, Camila Carr, she was kind of a stock player for Brown Rig. And she kind of elevates the material like once we get to the point where you have to start questioning if Frank really exists at all. Ke- or Kevin. If, yeah. Or if, Kevin. yeah, if yeah. Kevin, that's what I, that's the whole thing about it. It's like, what the hell, what is with Kevin? I don't know who this. Yeah. <laughs> we never see Kevin? Kevin, but yeah. yeah, eventually we get to the point where we have to start questioning um, if Kevin is real, <laughs> yeah. if Kevin like- ever existed. <laughs> 
if she's making Kevin up, if Kevin is like a split personality. Yeah. Um, and if Kevin does exist, their relationship definitely has some VC Andrews, like really unsavory <laughs> vibes going on. Yeah. Um, and well, this doesn't make a whole lot of narrative sense. I'm not going to lie to you all. It doesn't. <laughs> What it does have is it has like a really isolated and kind of eerie sense of atmosphere. And yeah. that's either going to click with you or it's not. Like I, the mood of this film is going to sit well with you and you're going to enjoy just kind of the weird ride it's going to take you on or you're going atmosphere. You know, to just not yeah. vibe with it at all. Because what it is, is it's a mood piece. But yeah, you never really find out what the truth or what's a lie. You're kind of left to mm-hmm. interpret it for yourself. Mm-hmm. What this is, is like I said, it's a pure mood piece. Yep. And for what it is, considering how little resource it had, it's pretty, and it's a, it's a pretty effective one. Um, it really yep. depends on how much you like your, you know, crazy women running about their right. you know empty i always houses. enjoy it i always enjoy cra- the crazy women stories <laughs> yeah yeah the kind of you know tormented woman like almost gothic but like almost gothic procedural yeah. kind of right. tr- lost in her own memories sort of film yep. but for what it is you know dollar 50 in a shoestring scrappy <laughs> regional film this yeah. one has a lot of mood to it so if that sounds like your bag yeah it doesn't yeah. quite get to the you know, deranged in like the deranged disjointed heights of something like Messiah of Evil. Mm-hmm. But if you like that sort of tone poem vibe, you might like this. And do you know where they filmed this, by the way? Um, I, I know what, it no, was no. in Texas. I don't know exactly okay. which part of Texas. Okay. So it was like a tech, um, I want to say outside Dallas. Okay. But that could be incorrect. Okay. I would need someone local to kind of give me the exact because you oh, do yeah. see enough of the exteriors and some of the shots to probably figure it out if you were familiar with that area. Oh, OK, I see. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But uh, yeah, I like this one, too. This was an interesting film. You, you made some good points on that one. I don't want to ruin it. That, that's like what I was trying. Yeah, to that's say the before, tricky but, part. You can't yeah. really talk about it without. Yeah. Ruining. But I was th- this was another one where I was watching it. And then, like, at a certain point, I noticed somebody that like I, I had seen before. I'm like, I know that guy from another movie. And I, and I it was uh, Chelsea Ross. And I, yeah, he was he, he was actually ma- had a career. Yeah, he was in Major League. You know, like you know, the guy he I forget his name in Major League. But he's like, hey, Joe, hey, hey bartender, Joe Boo needs a refill. And they, they hit him off the head with the baseball bat. You, you have to watch the movie if you haven't seen Major League. It's he, he was like really funny in that movie. I but, haven't watched that in probably yeah. like 10 or 15 years. Yeah, but I, I haven't have seen it. Yeah, but uh, so that's where I knew him from. And he was also in like another Steven Seagal movie. I think he was in Above the Law, I think. You'd him, be but, surprised yeah. when but you go through these kind of bottom of the barrel films. It was like their first people, movie. Yeah, it's yeah. their very first movie. It was the first part they could get, which is kind of very sweet in its own way. And also, uh, what's that guy's name? Steven Tobolowski. That was his first movie, too, I think. But I, I, I mean, I'm not like I don't really know his career well, but I, I know the name. He, you know, he's in a ton of stuff. Like he's still working now. There's a lot of that yeah. guy from that yeah. thing action yeah. across this. Even Tobolowski. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's another thing. Like that's, that's what I found throughout these movies. Like I, I knew these people, like some certain actors, like I'd see pop up and like, I knew them from other things, which is like always funny, funny to see. But uh, yeah, that was a really that, keep my grave open was another one. I liked a lot on the list. I, well, I'm glad, you know, you yep. got something out of at least a few of these, because I mean, not yep. everything on this list is going to be to everyone's taste, but I yep. tried to include a little something for everybody. Yep. I, and I like that one a lot. I did have like probably several that I liked a lot. So, you know, and you can't, it's, it's and especially like, you know, when it's one of those things where one person, you know, you have your certain taste and like, you know, the stuff that you would like, I probably wouldn't like. And then there's other stuff that we just like this, you know, the black room. That's one that we really, both really liked. Yeah. I so, tried to, you know, keep this yeah. list kind of hopping across genres yeah. and yep. different styles. So this way, you know, everybody listening, you know, anyone who might come across it can find something that might fit whatever their personal bag is. Mm-hmm. Sure. Makes sense. Yeah, that was really good. What's the next on the list? Next on the list is Depending on what print of this film you see, it's either Teenage Innocence or Little Miss Innocence from 1973. Director here is Chris Warfield. Um, This film is interesting and kind of it shows how much more porous and how much more fluid the boundaries between quote unquote mainstream film, exploitation film, um, Mm. softcore and hardcore used to be. Um, The director was a television actor early in his career. 
-hmm. He later made both softcore films like this and mm -hmm. then used a pseudonym to make some pretty early, well-regarded hardcore classics. Um, oh. Champagne for Breakfast, I believe is his. Oh, wow. And he kind of took that experience and his cast for this film, you know, kind of came from all over the map. Like John Alderman is in this and John Alderman is like, one of those patron saints of like low budget films. He was in everything, softcore, right. hardcore, genre stuff, exploitation. He was everywhere. Him sounds good, familiar. Yeah. Yeah. For a good 20 to 30 years. Wow. He actually pops, um, can, kind of pops up in more than one related thing to yep. this list. <laughs> oh, yeah. But um, we have Sandy Dempsey, who is mostly known for softcore films, and Terry mm -hmm. Johnson, who yep. is mostly known for adult films. This is a very small, very claustrophobic film. Um, basically, John Alderman is a swinging music executive named Rick Engels. Mm -hmm. He is a middle-aged guy, you know, and he picks up these two girls and he thinks it's going to be nothing but a good time. They're just good time girl hippies. And, you know, it's just going to be fun. And it is for about two days <laughs> until they Funny. won't leave. And what begins as kind of a bit of, you know, one off kind of let's have a fling fun becomes an active nightmare because things escalate to blackmail and kind of physical abuse and the way that too much of anything is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And what initially begins as a heaven of a weekend for like, you know, this kind of wanting to still be relevant middle aged man well, you got everything you have ever asked for out of these two women. And mm. the hell it is now you have to live with it. You got, you got all you ask for and more out of them. Yeah. And <laughs> now you have to live with exactly that. Yep. Um, it's yep. very similar in plot to Death Game, which I feel yeah, like I was going to slightly... actually go, I was going to bring that up. I was just going to yeah. say that Death Game. Yeah, it's just From it's sort of the same idea, which I believe was directed by Peter Trainer. Yeah. And um, it was Col also, Colleen Camp Ryan and House the... releasing has been teasing for a very long time. Yep. I know that's I thought that was going to be coming out soon, but I guess it's not. I don't know when. Not yet. Yeah. But in any case, it is a very similar plot line. Mm -hmm. But I like this film a little better just because the mm -hmm. performances are a bit more natural. Mm -hmm. um, Death Game kind of starts at 11 and stays there. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, pretty over the top. There's so much cackling. There's so much screaming. Yeah. There's so much shouting. There's, you know, immediately just kind of violence and it, chaos. It, like, yeah. I mean, it, like it feels like this one kind of like, it like organically becomes what it should, you know, to that yeah. point. The, the this, other one just starts out at that point and just keeps going from that point. Which yeah, is and weird, kind of leaves yeah. the characters nowhere to go. So you're like, this what the starts hell? out yeah. like the most lighthearted of sexploitation flicks. Yeah, right. This starts out right. of in a very cheerful, innocent manner. way, sort of an innocent yeah. way or whatever. I well, guess for innocent ish, the, you know. because you <laughs> can't tell me that man didn't yeah. know what he was doing. Yeah, he's like, he's like, here, have some more brandy. Have yeah. another glass of brandy. Oh, you know, <laughs> are you? Are you sure you guys don't want to come in? Are you sure yeah, you don't want to drink? But, yeah, but didn't it? But didn't the girls like he was just like, oh yeah, well have a nice day, see you later, and like then like they like come up to his house and he's just like, oh yeah, I'm just like working on my stuff. I'm not. He wasn't even doing anything. He was just like minding his own business. And then like they came, they came up to him, which I well, thought was you funny. Well, he also made sure to make sure that they knew yeah. exactly yeah. where he was. So he, oh, yeah, was I guess they did. Whatever yeah, yeah. happened, he just yeah. wasn't expecting the end result. <laughs> Yeah, that was funny. And I, was like, I like that this film, like like you said, it builds more organically. It yeah, seems yeah. very, very innocent at first mm -hmm. until it's right. not. Right. And, and you know, also it's just when we get towards the end of the film and kind of the character motivations are revealed, mm -hmm. the performances are actually surprisingly decent for people who aren't necessarily known for their acting. Right. They, they, they did a good job for what they had to deal with in the story, which was good. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, it was kind of nice yeah. to see yeah. a director pull that performance out of an adult performer, you know, because yeah, typically they're the butt of jokes for not really having <laughs> a whole lot of skills in that right. regard. Yeah, true. And but that, I kind of yeah. like this as a time capsule of how different things were at that time where you could be in a genre film and then the next week be in a softcore film and then maybe, yeah. you know, there were some actors that eventually started working in hardcore as well. Mm hmm. And I love I love the, uh, you know, go, I love the, the the intro song. It was like Little Miss Innocent. I don't know. I just like that little 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 song that they did. Well, at, considering you know. it's about a music composer, how could it not yeah. have a theme? Yeah, it was good. It was, that, and quite it was kind frankly, of funny. I, I think someone needs to do a compilation album of yeah. like all, those, all of the various exploitation movies. I love that music. 
I love all those songs. And that, and there was some nice shots like of like, I don't know where it was like Hollywood Boulevard out of wherever those were like the Cinerama dome and like yeah, Cinerama MGM dome. studios. It was and, in and around yeah. Hollywood. Yeah. Mostly, right. From what yeah, I can tell cool. again, um, someone from Los Angeles would probably have a better yeah, handle. They'd know where, what street it was on. It's or definitely, you know, yeah. a nice time capsule of Hollywood. Yeah. Most of that footage is probably no permits. Yep. Shoot it like you stole it. Cause you did. It was like a nice little mellow gold, like, you know, seventies, you know, like, you know, you think everything's going to be like, you know, love, you know, peace and love and stuff. And it was just, it just didn't happen at that, at the end, but <laughs> that was good. Yeah. I, I like it yeah. when, you know, and this is a recurring theme on this list. I think you might've yeah. brought this up earlier. Yeah. Um, Power dynamics always work in low right. budget films. Yeah. Because you don't them. necessarily need a lot of money. Yeah. To put your characters on uneven footing. And whether yeah, that's, that's you know, a rich middle aged man versus these two Some girls. girls. Yeah. Whether or that's, like, you know, an indie film versus a Hollywood machine. <laughs> or zombies versus <laughs> some people, <laughs> some innocent people. Well, you know. Yeah. In the case of zombies, yeah. I think yeah. the power dynamic yeah. would be there's so many more zombies than there yeah, are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah. They're outnumbered. But you're They're saying like you're saying like when it's just like a couple people like in the movie like type thing as opposed well, to. Well, not even. Yeah. You could do it okay. with a couple people. Yeah. You could also yeah. do it with a lot of extras. Yeah. But it doesn't necessarily yeah. require a lot yeah. of budget. It doesn't require yeah. monster makeups. It doesn't require right. elaborate sets. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good, good idea. Um, there is a movie on this list. We'll get to it that mm-hmm. reaches way beyond its price point, trying to do way more than it can afford. Mm-hmm. But most of these movies are small scale movies where yeah. the imbalance of power is what yeah. makes the dynamic run. Whether it's one right. character has supernatural powers and one doesn't, whether yep. it's systemic power, whether right. it's you know economic power. Someone's being held against their will or something or whatever. Yeah, like someone yeah. is being yeah. held captive yeah. is a common theme because these are things that you can effectively accomplish if you don't have budget. Mm-hmm. And I like it when a movie manages to work with what it has in an effective way. Right. Yeah, that's a really good point. I agree completely. Um, is that all for uh, Little Miss Innocence? That was a pretty short movie. That was like 50 minutes or something. 55 minutes, I think. Or it, wasn't, no, it, was a, it was like an hour. It was a little I don't bit know. longer than yeah. that, but yeah. it's not long. It's it very, very featured. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I like that one. That was, you know, it was good, but it probably not one of my I, I, I think I needed a little bit more to from from the story than that than what it had. But it was interesting. Like even Death Game. I'm not like I didn't really love that one either. I, it was OK, but I'll I mean, probably you know what I mean? no, no, no. for saying this, but yeah. I hate that movie. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not that great, really. I mean, it's not one of my um, favorite stories. I mean, I like, you know, the and I liked all the actors in it. I liked, you know, it was Colleen Camp, Sandra Locke and uh, Seymour Cassell. I like them, yeah, but it, I, I just thought the story just, wasn't my. It starts my thing. out at eleven, yeah. and it has yeah. nowhere else to go. Yeah, it just and it, it, it just, didn't hold my attention. It didn't hold my interest. By the interest time as much. you get to the minute and a half close up of spilled yeah. ketchup, I was just yeah. done with that movie. Yeah, I mean, it's just you know, it, it just it wasn't very satisfying. But no, anyways, no, anyway, they can't they can't all be winners. But uh, no, they can't all be winners, <laughs> yeah, and I know yeah, lots of people right. love that movie. Yeah. So if you do, yeah. I'm not you know right. Harsh it's, your you, it's your taste. It's like what whatever you like, you like. We we're not against that, but you know we we have our taste too. So. Next up on this list, this is actually one of my top five favorite exploitation movies. And this is also, if anyone listening has any connections um, to -hmm. getting this film out of VHS limbo, The Psychopath, also known as an eye for an eye, also from 1973. Um, 1973 was a real good year for the grindhouses. Let me tell Mm -hmm. you, even just on this list, there's multiple movies from that year. Mm -hmm. Um, This is directed by Larry G. Brown, who had a very short filmography. I think he only did three or four films. Um, Our main star is Tom Basham, who was also in one of Larry G. Brown's other films, a gay biker flick called The Pink Angels. I've seen that one, but I I haven't watched it recently. But so I'd have if I watch it now, I'd know who who he was and I'd be looking out for him. (laughs) But that's um, he has a much smaller part in that. Yeah, he's just one of those one of the bikers. Yeah. Um, A lot of people. (laughs) for a lot of reasons, you know, tend to point to like the golden era exploitation and be like, oh, you couldn't make a movie like this anymore. This is one of the few cases where I wholeheartedly believe that's true. Yeah. I mean, this one was like, mine would green like this. This was such a messed up, crazy movie, but I I liked it though. I liked it for that aspect. Um, What we have here is a children's TV host, Mr. (laughs) Rabby. Mr. Rabby. (laughs) <laughs> and I kind of am a little confused as to who would let this man around children because he's very obviously stunted. He's like something's he wrong like with this guy and yeah. talks like a child. Yeah, it's and very like, like asks yeah. his producer for chocolate cake in between takes. He's very. Oh, my God. He's like Peter a man. Child. He's a man. Child. Most, 
a man unclean child. Unclean possible way. Yeah, a very much a man child. That's like what I thought. Yeah, I'm and he loves children hell? and yeah. he is, you know, loves performing for children. <laughs> yeah. And love, you know, he goes to the and park God and help plays us. with kids <laughs> on his all yeah. time. Yeah. And the whole thing, even it's very unsettling. He's a very yeah. uncertain character. I think yeah. the performance is very good here. Yeah. There's it, it, something it, it, about it, him that's way too intense. Very and disturbing even the too. little bit of his performances you see. Yeah. in the hospital, on the soundstage. The mm-hmm. puppet shows he puts on are really weirdly violent. Yeah, like everybody's always getting killed. They're like dropping. Yeah, everyone's always trying to, which is kind <laughs> of a common thing in most cartoons, but this is yeah. in a really obvious way. <laughs> like we're going to lock oh the baby God. in the basement. Isn't that fun, kids? <laughs> That's, I mean, it's just, you know, it was it was just a, such a weird character, weird performance like from this yeah, guy. Yeah, like accordingly, oh when he discovers that some of his fans are the children of abusive parents, Yep. He kind of snaps. Yep. He has an absolute break. And because this main character is so kind of unsympathetic and unwholesome, the parents are almost cartoonishly villainous. Yeah, it's because it, that's the thing with this character is like when he's when he goes off, like you, you, I'm almost sort of like on his side at the same time. Because yeah, I'm, you have okay, to be he, he kind and of the like only way that deserve that works, it, like, you know. Is yeah. by making the parents like the absolute worst people imaginable. Right. But it's but it's it's that's the whole thing with this with this movie is like you're kind of on his, you're on his side. But then like at the same time, you're like, I'm on the side with this like, this Looney Tune, this yeah, like, like weirdo, weirdo, like children, child obsessed dude. I, I don't know. Like what the hell was, you know, what yeah. did feel with this guy? It's, but, it's a very weird yeah. little film. Such a strange. It kind of forces you to have sympathy for this unsympathetic character. Yeah. And while this isn't terribly violent it isn't terribly yeah. bloody like it was cut yeah. at a pg keeping in yeah. mind that pg-13 did not exist yet as a rating yeah that's weird. but much like something like the baby yeah the baby it's probably oh, that's kind of reminds me of that yeah yeah it definitely it has that that's same kind of like psychosexual is, issues universe yeah, that's sort of like the, the, that would be a good double feature the psychopath and the baby you'd be like oh yeah i kind of i always picture. i always thought of like um love me deadly toys are not for yeah. children and the baby uh, Oh my god! I, I think I, I'm not sure if I've seen those. I I, I I don't know. I don't know if I've seen those. Like if you want to go for kind like of the daddy it, issues on the deuce, you know, parent issues on the deuce, like triple feature. <laughs> there fun. it is. Yeah, that's. But a- this definitely belongs to that same kind of like really disjointed like psychosexual universe, and you never really find out what Mister Rabbi's backstory is. Like was you he abused really or something? But and and you know the woman that that he's with was that his. Was that that wasn't his wife or anything, right? No, it's, it's his television producer, and okay, she kind just, of acts as like a surrogate hell? mom. Yeah, I was wondering what their relationship was. Like, was it as his wife? And then, like, I guess I understood that at the end. But like, I was just like, why is this lady like with this guy? And like, remember the scene like where he's like at the at the dinner table and he started like saying all this stuff to her, and he's like, oh my god, if if someone said that to me, I'd be like out out the door because it's just too creepy. Yeah, and I don't know, out. and you don't really get a it's good like, reason, yeah. of why she's so invested in like babysitting. Yeah, I, I just don't get it. It's I guess because he was he was just a good like a, he was doing good for his TV show. Yeah, something. I assume in the universe of yeah. the show, his TV yeah. show was popular. Yeah, so that must but, have been what it is. But by the end, it's like, what the you know, you don't know what this, the hell um, this like I said, this isn't like overtly violent. This isn't particularly bloody. Yeah, but it definitely yeah. is kind of like a proto slasher where, yeah, you is. know, he starts stalking these parents one by one and killing them in kind of these creatively vicious ways. Yeah, right. Um his favorite blankie, a lawnmower, you know, a lawnmower <laughs> seems good, but uh, these yeah. kind of creatively messed up ways. Yep. And it's such an odd little film and it's so it mean spirited. You know, it, the, the way it looked though, the, like the production value, it almost looked like a TV movie though. And in some ways, I don't know, like it didn't look like, a, I don't know how much of I mean? that is like the way it's shot. I don't know how it much almost of looks that like is. That. Again, we're working on a very low quality print here. Yeah, it was weird. I it was would like, be uh, very curious to see how this movie looks. Yeah, like, clean now. Up. Yeah, it's it's really weird. And John Ashton is in it, which that must have been one of his first roles. That was another another uh, actor that popped up. And also, this, the this. actress that plays the nurse had a very long career. And this I don't was, know. Um, I didn't catch the her. Hospital right. nurse. Okay, I don't think I caught her. Who that was? Um, John, John Ashton. To... Yeah, John Ashton. People know from Beverly Hills Cop. He plays like you know the Sergeant Taggart, I think, in that movie. But you know that you know that guy. He's been in lots of movies. And then he was in like some kind of wonderful. He plays the the father in that one. But you know, but it's just funny to see like these actors like in their very very beginnings of their career. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's 
again, this list is going to be full of here's, you know, that girl, that guy from that right. thing. Yep. Margaret Avery. That's who the nurse. Margaret. Was, that sounds who had a long career yep. in a whole bunch of things. Like I'm sure she I'm was the lead her. in the movie, The Color Purple. Oh, yeah, Which I know. Is, yeah, I know that. Yeah, I know that who she is. Yeah. Yeah. She's Margaret the nurse Avery. in this, in that whole. OK, so that was one of her scene. first roles. And yep. I do think in all of this, like, absolute fucking manic weirdness, mm -hmm. there is a bit of genuine empathy and frustration for the people who yeah. are trying to stop child abuse, but because yeah. of all of the bureaucracy are maybe less effective than they could be. Yeah. That does read as genuine to me. But yeah. mostly this movie just wants to let its freak flag fly. <laughs> it's such a weird and, tone. Yeah, it's and it goes strange. all the way. Like, it, like I said, for something that isn't explicitly violent, it is really unsettling and it's yeah. really kind of mean-spirited and vicious <laughs> how these people die even if yep. you don't see the blood yep um i am not the only person who is a huge fan of this film um joe spinell clearly joe loved this movie because really because maniac or something because maniac 2 which they never got to make maniac there's a 2. demo reel you can watch on youtube and he was yeah and he was mr robbie Oh my God, that's weird. And, I didn't know that. That's you know, some interesting. He kind of puts on this persona, and you can tell that the reference. I love that movie. Path. Yeah, and I love Maniac. I love, and I love the voiceover. Yeah, they never Maniac. got to make the laugh. sequel, but the sequel was clearly, you know, kind of influenced by the madness oh of this film based on that show reel at the it's very seen, least. That makes you can sense. Watch the footage on YouTube. Okay, I didn't know about that. That's really cool. I didn't even know yeah, there was going to so, be. A movie. I mean, he's got good taste. So yeah. do we. So yeah, if we you do. Can find this, watch this. Yeah, I mean, that was a it was such a weird oddity, like, you know, I mean, one of those you just don't know what the hell's going on and like who made it and like, you know, wh what they and, were like, thinking or who greenlit it and who, yeah, what they were it's thinking. Such a weird, and there's yeah. so many character traits that are put yeah. into the Mr. Robbie character that are weirdly specific. Yeah, I mean, the, like, the whole the whole like look of the film, like it, it almost feels like like I was watching. I was like, it almost feels like a 60s, like kind of like a fun, like not a I don't know. I didn't know how to describe it. It, it wasn't the 60s, but it was like it felt like sort of like a like it, it should have been like a fun, like a funny, like, like TV movie, fun, like, like, a, yeah, like a fun TV. Yeah, something like that. But then it like just totally like changes the, that tone and goes like into weird psycho madness. Like it's just weird. Such a yeah. weird thing. So, I mean, if you really want a yeah. movie that they could never make today for about yeah, 35 different much. reasons, what find this. Hell? Watch it. It's no amazing. Weird. Trust me. That would be a good one to see restored, too. On like some. some Absolutely. Stable. It needs it desperately. And it was also known as I, an eye for an eye. Yeah. Um, depending. The video title was The Psychopath. I've yep. seen actual um, like print ad mats that refer to it as an eye for an eye. Yep. Um, that appears to have been like more like it, when it played uh, Southern drive-ins. Right. It's just, um, there's not a whole lot of documentation on this film, unfortunately, but from yeah, what I, I gather, it like it was yeah. an alternate um, theatrical title. I wonder where it played if it like and how long it played for. I mean, it must have been one of those. that just wasn't in the movie in theaters very long or something. I don't know. I, I think you, you even grindhouse know. audiences yeah. would be like, what the hell even is this? Yeah, it's like it's <laughs> such a weird thing. It definitely yeah. did play them, though, because yeah. um, if you've ever read Sleazoid Express. Yeah. Um, was it in Joe there? Landis specifically points out this movie as one okay. of the weirdest things he's ever seen. OK, because I, 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 yeah, I read that book. I had the book and I uh, and, I, and I, I probably read that, but I never saw the movie up until right now. So it's like I didn't know like what it what, really what it was. But that's uh, that's interesting to know that it played there. On the on, on on the deuce. On the deuce. Yeah, so it, it's it, it's an actual grindhouse movie, which is good. <laughs> that's that's cool. Yeah. Um, speaking of Shaggy Mania, I must have put this list together with this in mind. Yeah. <laughs> Scream Bloody Murder from 1973. Yeah, I love that, yeah, I love that movie. That was that, um, that's that's the only one I saw on the whole list. Before, like going. Oh, this was it. the only yeah. one you had previously seen. Yeah, that's the only one I had pre previously. Works. seen on a lot of those like 50 movies, pan and scan, public domain kind of sets. Yeah. Yep. yep. Um, the director never made another movie. The lead actor never made another movie. The lead actress only ma ever made one other movie. Well, like I, this is absolutely like California regional cheapy. And I noticed that the, the, the director of photography was Stephen H. Burham. And he worked with like a whole, he worked with like Brian De Palma and stuff, I think. Well, I mean, he's probably awesome. one you know, of the few people movies. on this film who ever actually had a career. Had any kind of career. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. So I was like, I was. It's funny when you notice like those little details, like the, those types of things. Like it's yeah, the little like yeah, 
odd connections between things and how you can play some really interesting six degrees of separation with yeah, some of really. these films. But, but this one is a lot of single serving crew. Yeah. I mean, it's like, there's nobody, they didn't really have much. No, there's nothing else to really reference from, you know what I mean? Like reference that they did or anything. Cause they're, 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 they didn't have any. this is a super manic film. We have set pieces ripped off from about 15 different places. We have plot <laughs> elements ripped off from 15 different places rather than deciding what kind of film it wants to be. It just kind of keeps throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks. <laughs> Um, because <laughs> you open with that's a set piece fun. that's kind of ripped off from the bad seed where yeah. the young Matthew kills yeah. his father, but because he's not real good at this whole homicidal maniac <laughs> thing, he yeah. also manages to rip his own hand off oh my in a God. tractor. That was crazy too. I, I didn't and, get and that. <laughs> he ends up in a mental institution. He has a hook for a hand, but the hook isn't used to kill anyone until the very end of the film. <laughs> So it's just kind of there for the sake of, you know, look, he's got a hook (laughs) and he comes back home from the mental institution and he just can't stand that his mother is happy with a new husband because he has some weird edible like mommy issues. (laughs) And, you know, this go on, you know, he's right out of the we're going to rip off cycle a little bit and have, you know, this guy with weird sexual issues towards his mother. Right. And I love just how manic this movie is. It just never stops moving. You know, he comes home from a mental institution. He has a hook for a hand. He murders his parents. He murders some hitchhikers. He murders some people that try to help him. And before you know it, he's kidnapping prostitutes and killing, you know, the entire. What was her name? Daisy? <laughs> what was it? What did he call her? Daisy or something like that? And her name was like Vera. Her name or, is I can't actually remember. Vera. And he yeah, decides Vera, that yeah. her name. I don't know how I remember that, but <laughs> yeah, Vera. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And he kind of like makes her into (laughs) his personal fantasy girl and he's keeping her captive tied to the bed and going, well, just because you're not dead and I feed you steaks and I bring you things (laughs) to paint with while you're chained to this, you know, dead person's bed. Why aren't you happy? I know it's funny. And I I thought it was funny how he just like, no matter what he he like, he's like, oh yeah, I'm going to go steal that mansion from like these people. He just walks in, kills the people. takes over the whole mansion like it's like you know he's just going yeah, he's he's, he has no make like himself into the ideal man there's no off button in at the all. most psychotic way possible yeah he just does whatever the hell he wants to do it's like hilarious yes. and it's all going to come falling in on his head but he's yeah. not cognizant cognizant of that because every woman he sees he basically yeah. has these weird flashbacks to yeah. his murdered mother scolding yeah. him for being such a dirty little psycho <laughs> Which, to be funny. fair he is yep and that's funny. Like his mom hates him for good reasons. Yep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's but nonetheless, brat. <laughs> I love how balls to the wall this is. It's yeah. throwing everything it can out onto the screen in the hopes that something sticks. It's a very entertaining. It's very though. shaggy. Yeah. It's very it's silly, entertaining. But it yeah. moves so fast. Yeah. That it's, like, it's it, kind of okay. You never have a chance yeah. to get bored. I, I enjoyed this. This is another one that I liked a lot. And I thought it was funny, like when he's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go shopping. And he like he goes, what does he do? He like takes the, the car. And he like buys a bunch of stuff, kills some people, then like buys some goes shopping some more. And like, you know, he's just like killing people in between. Yeah, going like shopping. He kills people the way most people will go to the store to get like a gallon yeah, of milk. I call him like a shopping spree killer. He, that's what I, it was. My little joke. <laughs> Shopping spree. Yeah, he kills people like most people will go to the corner store. Yeah, like, I just you know, thought that was funny. Go out for a pack of it's cigarettes. Totally he like, goes out for some homicide and some yeah, ice cream. That was funny. That was hilarious. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I really like this. Like the line deliveries are very campy in spots. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's very fast. Mm-hmm. And I've always liked this is that yeah. Vera's character never stops trying to escape. She yeah, is she not does. the dumb victim. Yeah, that she's like, found she's in really horror smart. movies like at yeah. all. Yeah, she's re- really smart. Like she's sort of like an independent woman. She's like, yeah, yeah. What? She's really she's smart and she's like really real. fierce. Like yeah. every time he turns his back, she's trying to escape. Every right. chance she has yeah. to defy him, whether it's refusing to eat, whether it's yeah. um, insisting on being called uh, her real name. And what, what she's was, not what he, helpless. <laughs> what was he all. feeding her? It was like, here, eat this chicken parmesan. I don't know what the hell it was. It was like, yeah, it was some something. non-specific. It was thing so weird the way it looked it. to me. I don't know why. Yeah, it did not look appetizing <laughs> in the slightest. It looked like it was probably like it was probably cold. I mean, like he was like, here, eat, eat your delicious spaghetti. <laughs> yeah. Again, in his universe, he he's in a separate world than everyone else. Where yeah, you know the fact stuff. that you murdered the inhabitants of a mansion and oh, basically God. started squatting in it somehow makes in, you the dream man for the woman stuffed, you kidnapped. He stuffed him in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's like, oh, stay in there. 
Yeah, but I mean, as far as like little tiny regional filmmaking, no stars, no frills, but it was really good. It was a good one. Yeah, it's just no breaks. Absolutely no breaks. So for yeah. people who like that kind of manic energy, you'll yeah. have a lot of fun with this one. It's yeah. everything. Yeah. It's trying to be a little bit of everything all of the time. It doesn't exactly succeed, but you never have a chance to get bored because the film never yeah. really. Comes I think up that's why me. I liked it because it wasn't like boring. You you just keep going. He's he's yeah. killing more just, people or you know do he's doing the next. There's thing. always like, something the crazy thing. on screen. Yeah. There's always something happening. Right. You know it sticks to. It knows yeah. that a movie has to move. Yeah. And that makes and then, it a lot of fun. And then the last, I don't, I'm not going to spoil it, but the last shot, I was like, whoa, where, where, where is this going? And then he goes to like this place <laughs> and it's like this long sh- tracking shot or dolly shot or where, you know, whatever it was, you know, that, you know what I'm talking about? That how, I it, mean, how it ends. Like, movie, it's they weird. probably stuck the camera on like a radio flyer wheelbarrow and hope yeah, for the best. And just pulled it down the thing. But it, yeah, it just, just pulled it down a, the road. Like, it was such a like unexpected ending, like the way that the way it ended. I was it's like, I, I think I it just, was just I we like ran out of too. money. Let's wrap this up. Yeah, I just liked I liked, you know, it, it, whatever they did, it kind of came out kind of good in the end. It just worked like for me. I just liked the whole the whole the way the thing went, the pacing and the, you know, the characters, you know, whatever. The, you know, they're probably not the best characters, but it was it was entertaining enough for me. I liked it all, enough. And none of those people worked again, like, you know, Fred. Um, Holbert or, the woman who played yeah. Vera slash Daisy, yeah. he was Mitchell. in one other film. Yeah. The lead actor, I think this is his only credit. Well, wow, it's weird. So it really was like a little one off independent movie. Yeah, like, you yeah. know, I don't think any of these people were really uh, seasoned <laughs> professional. Yeah, they weren't. Yeah, that was but funny. Again, I love regional filmmaking. I think that every movie that gets made is a tiny miracle, even the bad ones. Yeah. And this is kind of an example of that. Yep, true. Yeah, that was a good one. So what's next on the list? Okay, where are we? Oh, we're getting serious now. <laughs> um, the next thing on the list is The Shame of Patti Smith. Oh, yeah. That's another one I liked. Might just yeah. um, alternately title, I believe, The Case of Patti Smith or just Patti. Just Patti. And that yeah. girl was, that girl didn't have a big career either. Was it Danny Lynn? She did have a bit of a career. A little this bit is, of a career. Um, directed yeah. by Leo Handel. It's from 1962. Yeah. Yeah. Our lead, Danny Lynn, had a small career in television, yeah. oh, and yeah, yeah. she also did a couple of like B movies. Okay. Um, Mary Anders, who played yeah. Mary, mm-hmm. was probably more of the working actress. She had a long career in television as well. Okay. Um, so this Danny one Lynn- is not what I expected it to be at all. Yeah, this that's the way I felt too. I thought it was going to be one thing, but then it like went another way, and I I just yeah. I think it's one of the best movies of the list myself. Yeah, like in terms of actual merit as a film, yeah. this is probably one of the, um, the best easier yeah. cases to argue yep. as far as films on this list. Right. Um, title and synopsis, I was expecting this to be like a really screechy, like youth gone wrong, um, something like 1970s, The Long Road or, 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 a or something. something weird video double featured this with You've Ruined Me, Eddie. Yeah. Like, I thought it was going to be like a roughy movie or like one of those, you know, like a, 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 a juvenile delinquent film or something. Yeah, like I was definitely I wasn't necessarily thinking a roughy, but I was definitely yeah. juvenile okay. delinquency, melodrama like that, um, you know, girl gone bad. Right. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what I thought. Film. Especially with the first how it starts with those like guys like, you know, the you know, the uh, the punk guys come, you know, coming into the yeah. story and- straight out of central casting from like yeah. a juvenile delinquency film. What this yep. is, is actually something that's a bit more sad and a bit more yeah. sensitive. Yeah. Because I mean, Patty, we set her up as she's an ordinary girl mm-hmm. and she's out on a date with her useless boyfriend. Because I don't know why the boyfriends <laughs> in these films are always useless, but they are. Yeah. And they have an altercation with three young punks who mm-hmm. I believe, do they steal the car? They steal the car and they assault Patty in front of her boyfriend. And the whole film is her seeking to terminate a pregnancy caused by a sexual assault, mm-hmm. which is some pretty heavy stuff for this kind of movie. Yeah. And it's not treated for melodrama. You know, we have some experienced television actors in the lead. Mm-hmm. So this ends up becoming like a weirdly earnest and really sensitive film yep. that. It's like a cautionary tale or like a, you know, like a, this feels, because keep in mind, this Drama. was, you know, a solid, you know, a solid few years before Roe versus Wade. 
Yeah. So it feels like they were genuinely advocating for a pro-choice kind of worldview mm-hmm. to prevent yeah. cases like this, because right. obviously the women Patty totally like has, them. you know, a long journey to a back alley abortionist. Right. It's sort and of like- she doesn't make it. Yeah, it's. Um, yeah, I mean, I was like, this was one one where I was like, I, I was expecting one thing and got another thing. And I really got kind of like wrapped up in the story. And like, by the end, I was just like, wow, it was such a like sad thing. The first two times I watched this, it made yeah. me cry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was it was I mean, it was it was emotional. Like, you, yeah, it, like it was I think very- it was. Yeah, I think it Danny Lynn's performance was what it did what was for, was what made that because I was expecting to be a little bit like more goofy or something like more yeah, like something that plays it so well. Camp. Yeah. And you, 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 you like, you know, she's 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 so like innocent, like she's just like, you know, I, I just want to do the right thing. And she, yeah, goes, and she goes to crying. everybody. And yeah, she goes, yeah, she to, she goes talks to, to everybody. her priest. She goes to yeah. her doctor. She she, goes like to no her one's mother. really helping her. And, it, yeah, and it's and not there's none of that. Like, you know, you, you're kind of like expecting there to be some type of like weird corniness or, you know, like something yeah. that doesn't play right. But she she doesn't through the whole movie. She's just very like straight. She plays it. Yeah, it's right. very yeah. earnest. It's yeah. not earnest, camp. Yeah. It's not yeah. melodramatic at all. Yeah. And I like that about about it. Yeah, the performances are extremely sensitive. Yeah. Um, Leo Handel, who directed this, mm-hmm. was um, had a long career doing like classroom films. Oh. So there are some insert points in this film yeah. that are kind of like white coder, like informational. Oh, yeah. And it's yeah. one of the few cases <laughs> where I feel that device was used to actually try to educate people in yeah. terms of the it wasn't done in a bad way in other countries. The reality yeah. of denying women choice ends up with girls on dirty tables and, yeah. you know, back, right. back alleys. alleys. Yeah. Yep. Um, I do feel like they were actually trying to educate or change people's minds. And I think in addition to the performances being better than average here, mm-hmm. the part of this that really kind of hits like a brick yeah. is this was 60 years ago. Nin- and so in 1962, while Roe versus Wade really did happen, yeah. a lot of the arguments, both um, pro-choice and pro-life, yeah. haven't changed in the slightest. Yeah, which is weird. Like we're still having the exact same conversation, yeah, often weird. with the same consequences for young women. Yeah, that's really crazy when you think about it. It's just, you know, it's, it was just a sad story. And when the, she goes to like the, uh, you know, the, the abortion place, it's like, what is it like a massage parlor or something like that? It's yeah. Like, it's like a massage parlor. Or like they're, the they're, back they're, of those a people spa. are so shady. The people at that place that are so sequence, shady. Yeah. Like when she meets with the, yeah. you know, I guess the driver. The, the, the quote, the oh yeah. The, yeah. And the, and the, if, if people have seen the, the show, the Waltons, the driver is Ike Godsey. The, the, you know, the general store guy from the from the Waltons. I, that's another little character I noticed in the movie. Joe Conley, I think his name is the actor. I thought I that was just a funny. I had never thing. watched the yeah. Waltons. I think yeah, we discussed you, you this off have, air, yeah, but I've never yeah. seen the Waltons. Yeah, that was something like, you know, like if you grew up like when I when I did, I was probably a little a little older than you. But that was like I used to watch that all the time. So I noticed him in there. But uh, what were you going to say? Yeah. Um, when it's like when she meets the driver for this, yeah. you know, back alley clinic. Yep. The whole thing is shot like a horror movie. Like that whole sequence yeah. is tense. It yeah, it's, scared it's me more than some like. actual horror films from that era. Yeah, to it's like a her walk through these dark alleys alone, and she's just a little itty bitty slip of a thing. You know, yeah, tiny like, girl. It's like, give me the money. I want the money yeah. before I take it to the place. Or, you know, whatever. Yeah. It's, it's, and then you know, the nurse crazy. is like yeah. leering at her, like a warden and a woman in prison. Yeah, it was today. very weird. It was just very yeah. creepy, that whole part. You know what I mean? Yeah, the whole part of it is just oh. seedy and it's very unnerving. Like I found very myself unnerving. biting my nails the first yeah, time I watched I, it. I, I mean, it definitely I, I, scared me I than more, more than any 60s horror movie. Yeah, you know, it was real. It was like real. It was like real horror. It wasn't like, you know, like, you know. Well, this like actually, as far as I can tell, though, it doesn't bear the based on a true yeah. story label. Yeah. Um, the reference point is a real case. Um, okay. uh, case in 1959 where they yep. found the body of a young woman on the grounds of a hospital oh my God. and she had died from a misperformed back alley abortion. Oh my God. That's terrible. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's um, just like, uh, really gross. Th- it, three years later, that particular case was still, um, in the national news wow. and the debate over pro-choice versus pro-life was really starting to kick up. So mm-hmm. the movie was probably made in response. Oh, wow. It's interesting. The timing works out very neatly that that oh, wow. would have made sense that this had like a timely yeah. topical hook in yeah. terms of the news cycle for that period. Oh, yeah. But it's an incredibly earnest yes, and 
even handed. And, you know, it's not trying to punish anyone. It's not trying to make anyone's choices for them. Right. It's It's just telling its case in a very like almost educational way. And it has a lot of empathy for all of its characters. It is. Uh, Yeah. Very good. I I really like that one a lot. One of the most out of the, out of the list. Yeah. So if you are ready to be excessively depressed, yep. but it's certainly worth watching. Yeah. But I mean, you know, it's, it's just, it it was such a good story. Like, you know, you, you, it, it is like sort of depressing, but it's like, you know, I just, I just really thought the story was so well told and played and and acted and everything. It didn't. This is an exploitation movie only because of the subject matter. Yeah. Not in the way that it was produced. It was a good. It would be a good movie for all people to see, like you know, different people to get an idea of what it what what happens that type of stuff. Yeah, to get an idea of historical context in terms of that particular social argument. Yeah. Um, really? This is only an exploitation film because of its subject matter. It's not approached yeah. as one in any other way. Yeah, it isn't really. It isn't. That's that's the whole thing. You think it's going to be one, and then it like just goes a different. You know, it goes the yeah. You know, like, by have actually treating things in a rather yeah. serious fashion, an earnest way. So like you said it's very depressing, but I think it's also mm-hmm. very important for historical context and. You know, it's also somewhat topical. Like I said, we're having a lot of the same conversations, and we're having a lot of the same arguments. Yep. True. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely like you know of of uh, it's still relevant that story. Yep. Yes. Yes. It is. There are still aspects of that story yep. that are absolutely relevant. Mm-hmm. And like I said, prepare yourself if you do watch it, but it is absolutely yep. worth watching. Yep, definitely, I agree. Re- another good pick. Another good pick on the list. So what, what what's next on the list? Okay, <laughs> we're gonna go with something a little less heavy now. I'm going to go back to uh, some stylish queer codedness with the slave alternate title okay. um, Check to the Queen. Those are both alternate uh, alternate English titles mm-hmm. from 1969, yep. uh, directed by Pasquale Festa Campanile. Um, this is basically a beautiful piece of what Tim Lucas, I believe from Video Watchdog, would call continental op. Continental um, op. <laughs> Yeah, Basically, you know, this is from that liminal moment where like softcore was starting to get more explicit, but hardcore wasn't the dominant mode. And mm-hmm. you had people kind of experimenting with like films that had sex and sexuality based topics in them that weren't necessarily hardcore porn, again, yeah. <clears throat> kind of an artier lens on a more sexual film. Mm-hmm. This is actually based on a novel. Um by Renato Hioto. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that last name correctly. Yep. Um, so this might have had a little bit of a, you know, 1960s, 50 Shades of Grey thing going on where it was a popular, like more erotically focused novel and thus it got a movie. Yep. Um, which kind of, you know, there's a place for that. I haven't read the source material um, because it's tricky to track down, but I'm planning to. Mm-hmm. What we have here is, again, another very simple story that base- mostly takes place in one very fabulous location. Um, you have a wealthy housewife named Sylvia. Her husband goes away on a business trip. She's left alone and she's bored. Mm-hmm. So she gets a job to have something to do. And she ends up working as the personal assistant for a very mercurial oh. movie star named Margaret. Mm-hmm. And their dynamic goes very much um, dominant submissive very quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, she's not just a personal assistant. You know, soon she's being told how to dress and what to wear and being used as a footstool or being forced (laughs) to read, you know, a book because Margaret is bored. It becomes very much a dominant submissive kind of more of a lifestyle sort of play than it does, you know, any strictly employee (laughs) assistant relationship. It was really, <clears throat> and this one is like this is the movie where I was like I I didn't know if I was gonna like get into it or not, but like by the time I like that I just kept watching it and watching it, and I was just like oh what's gonna happen now? But it's just then she starts the girl starts having what's her name Sylvia she starts Sylvia, having like blonde, she's yes. having like little like fantasy like little dream like daydream. Well, that's kind of why yeah. their dynamic yeah. goes that way in the first yeah. place because yeah. even in the car 
in yeah, the she's, first scene in the film. She wants to be bored. like a slave or something, or wants yeah, to be like, she's you know, having uh, very um, submissive fantasies, kind of yeah. bondage inflected. Yeah. There's a lot of great like psychedelic dream sequences. Yeah, that, that was are, weird. Like, it was like color gels they used and stuff. I don't know what type of stuff. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't know that it was necessarily all gels. Some of yeah. it was. Yeah, but yeah, them. there's some beautiful like psychedelic imagery. Yeah. There's some beautiful like fetish fueled fantasy sequences that because clearly this is something <laughs> Sylvia wants. Yeah. And what draws her to Margaret, even though Margaret is obviously very demanding and very difficult, is because Margaret is the closest thing Sylvia will likely have to make her fantasies a reality. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I, as, what the... as Margaret pushes the dynamic by, you know, treating her like a slave, mm -hmm. um, Sylvia is just as invested because she doesn't want to have to think for herself. She doesn't want to have to make all the decisions. She wants to be able to kind of let go. Yep. and let someone else do the hard part yep right that was interesting an interesting story i just you know i just I mean, and i just all liked of how this is yeah. very lush very lavish there's a lot of production value here yeah um beautiful clothes beautiful mod furniture the whole thing takes place in this beautiful looks like a villa and i love the music but it was, i think it was P piero piccioni did the music yeah piero. and it's got kind of this yeah. very late 60s kind of like Roman cha-cha, almost loungy yeah. vibe. I think it kind of reminded me a little bit of Jallo music too, which was probably one of the reasons I liked it. Like it had that sort of like weird, I don't know, like that kind of stuff. This is a bit more poppy. Yeah, it this is. This has definitely got like a bit more of a folky, like poppy yeah. summer of love. But it's like, you know, what it, you know what, it, you know what it, like those, those movies, like they'll have like scenes like in like a club or something or, or a party and like you'll hear that type of same type of music. Like yeah. that, of like, you know. Yeah. Um, it definitely had some similarities with the yeah. music in Baba Yaga yeah. Yeah. in spots yeah. Yeah. because they're both kind of relying on like that, like kind of Roman cocktail party, yeah. lounge right. poppy yeah. sort of territory. Yep. And I noticed that like this, when it came to the sex stuff, that they didn't, they didn't go like too far into the sexual, like, you know, graphic nature of it. They just showed a little bit of stuff. So you got the you idea know, of what's because... happening. So you're not getting like totally like, you know, into like hardcore sex stuff. It's just, you know, they're just kissing. No, not other, at all. You know, because at the end of the day, I think Sylvia is not really interested. Like, yeah, she's interested in sex. Yeah. And Margaret obviously is because she has like three boyfriends on retainer. <laughs> yeah. She hires back and forth when, you know, sends them away when she gets bored. Yeah. Um, <laughs> who is who is the, the main the, 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 the girl that played Margaret? I can't remember her name. Is it uh, Rosanna Schifiano, who okay. was kind of like a tabloid queen at that time, okay. kind of like famous for being famous. Okay. Nominally a model, nominally an actress, mostly famous for being a celebrity type of a, right. like type of a. We know people so like that. Casting to type. <laughs> yeah, we know people like that in our in our in our country. <laughs> yeah, our like time. you know that it's not unique to us. Yeah, so right. they were casting to type a little bit to have her play like this demanding model actress who she was, was good. I like all this her. money and all these fabulous yeah. things, and you know was used to getting exactly what she wanted. Yeah. And there really. isn't too much, yeah, there isn't too much vanilla sex in this movie because the sex isn't necessarily the point. Yeah, it's not, I mean. The point is the trust and the dynamic between these two yeah. women. Yep. Because in kind of agreeing to be submissive to Margaret, she's trusting Margaret, Margaret not to push her too far. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To take her places that she wants to go. Mm-hmm. But and, I mean, it was strangely like, like I watched the movie and like, you know, there's all that stuff going on, but then it's strangely like, there's like a sweetness to the movie. Like at the end, I just thought. Yeah. Like you can definitely tell, was. like, this wasn't the era where they were going to put this front and center. It was a bit too yeah. early, Yeah. but there's definitely like a queer love story going on. Like you can tell yeah. there comes a certain point where they're not just playing anymore. Yeah. There's something very tender <clears throat> and very tightly wound in their relationship. Like even with all like, you know, the, the fantasy sexual, you know, whatever it was, the sexual fantasy stuff, it was just like, there was just like a, it was like a very like, you know, tender kind of like love, love story too. And in, in there, which I. Well, yeah, because I mean, in her fantasies, in Sylvia's head, yeah. um, Margaret is always basically a queen, a goddess, mm -hmm. you know, a woman above all women. She's yep. obviously deeply in love and deeply infatuated with Margaret. Yep. And as much as Margaret kind of says some very disparaging things about lesbianism, um, I think she's trying to kind of fight the fact that she's in, a little bit in love with Sylvia too. Mm -hmm. And yep. that reads in the yep. film. Like this is too yep. early of an era to really make that text yep. rather than subtext. Yeah. Like that wouldn't have really happened. Like that would have been a bit too bold. 
for 1969, right. but it's it definitely great. there. And it's interesting because, well, a lot of exploitation films kind of, and, you know, Euro trash and kind of these cult and genre films mm -hmm. like to borrow from s and and dominance and submissive dynamics. Mm -hmm. Most of the time it's more for titillation of like a vanilla yeah. audience where right. this the power exchange is more the point than the sex. Right. And I noticed that, like, you know, the, she was like anti-lesbian and stuff like she she was like, oh, yeah, she's a lesbian. I don't even want her in the room or whatever she said. Yeah. But meanwhile, you know, that kind of reads in the context yeah. of the larger film that maybe she's yeah. protesting just a little bit too much. Yeah. She's like scared of being a lesbian. Or yeah. Something. She's scared of the fact that yeah. she's very much, you know, yep. tied to Sylvia and attracted to Sylvia. It doesn't yep. read necessarily as a homophobic thing, more of like a yep. self-loathing problem. Right. True. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, I, I, but I like this one, too. I just was like kind of like I said, like when I first started watching it, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to watch this whole thing because I just don't, you know, <laughs> I don't know if I connect with it enough. But then I just let it go and I just kept watching it. And by the end, I just it was like, hey, that wasn't that wasn't too bad. I kind of liked it. it was I good. mean, you, you kind of have to. It's a very slow, yeah, measured slow film. Thing. Yeah. Um, like, but give it, it a chance. gorgeous the whole way through. Yeah, In it terms was of aesthetic. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the costume design, the set yeah. design. Um, I think I liked all that topic. stuff. Yeah. I mean, I liked the music. I liked, like, you know, like you're saying, yeah. like costume design. You kind of just see things. And then, of course, the women are beautiful. So I'm, I'm like, kind of, you know, watching those, that stuff. And yeah. I mean, you've got like, beautiful uh, actresses yeah. doing yeah. kinky things in a gorgeous yeah. setting. Right. So if nothing yeah. else, even if the main story doesn't necessarily yeah. read to you as, yep. you know, if you don't care about kind of the off kill, like the off kilter love yeah. story that's going on it's yeah. worth watching for the aesthetic of it all yeah you could, it's one of those movies you can almost like watch it with the sound off and like you just yes. uh, whatever this or, and baba yaga if you yeah. don't care for yeah. the story of either of those films the visuals you can just and everything it and watch the visuals if you'd like because right. they're both super stylish artistic you know really beautiful looking pic pictures images but um yeah i like that one too so what year was that 1973 69 69 okay 69 that was good um, if anybody wants to watch it, I will caveat this. It's really tricky to find, but Mondo Macabro has yeah. um, a disc still in print that is an absolutely stunning transfer. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's a good one. That's one of the few on the list that has a good Blu-ray, I think. Uh, there's a couple. Okay. Yeah. Baba Yaga has uh, oh, yeah, Baba several Blu-rays. It was just yep. reissued by Shameless. Yep. I think um, I think the Yeti, uh, the next one on the list, Yeti has it just came out with Blu-ray. I think. Yes. Yeah. Which brings us to the to the final film on this list. And remember Our everything favorite. I was saying <laughs> yeah. about, you know, I like small scale movies that don't have yeah. budgets because, yep. you know, when you overreach your budgetary lane, yeah. well, forget all that. <laughs> yeah. This, this one went way uh, too far. Yeah, I know it did. This is our favorite Barry Gibb. <laughs> Barry Gibb as King Kong. The last movie on this list, and a fun note to end on, because this is yep. really silly, yeah. is Yeti, Giant of the 20th Century from 1977. Um, this was directed by Gianfranco Parolini. Yep. Um, I believe he's credited as Frank Kramer in yep. the grand Frank tradition Kramer. of Italian genre filmmakers um, angelicizing yep. their names. Yep, it is. And he directed one of my favorite Spaghetti Westerns. I have to mention that Sabata. He drank, directed Sabata. He directed a yeah. few Spaghetti Westerns, yeah, he did. right? He did. That's yeah, one of my that's, that's one of my favorites. But um, and uh, he also directed one of my favorite macaroni combat movies, Five for Hell. He did that one. You always know it's a, a well in this movie, this the one we're going to talk about. There's none none of this, but usually in a lot of his like um, you know, his his action movies, like they, there's always some type of like acrobatics going on. That's like how you know it's a Fra uh, Gianfranco Parolini movie. <laughs> There's always like some acrobatics or like spy, you know, like all types of like gadgets and stuff. That's what he uses in his movies. <laughs> oh, see, th yeah. this You'd have they to... didn't have the money for all that. Yeah, yeah. This was just <laughs> this was just like a King Kong ripoff, I think. Pretty yeah, much. This was yeah. definitely during the era yeah. of copyright infringement cinema, where everybody was yeah. jumping on the yeah. um, bandwagon remake <laughs> and doing their remake. best. This yeah. one is kind of unusual in that, in that it's yeah. not a straight up King Kong ripoff like the plot yeah. beats are, but the central yeah. feature isn't a monkey. They yeah. figured, I guess, it gave them a suitable <laughs> dodge for copyright claim <laughs> to make the creature a Yeti. Yeah. What is it? Like um, a big Sasquatch? This is an Italian Canadian co production. <laughs> yeah. This is an international mess. <laughs> It's really a, such a weird, I mean, it, you know, it reminded me of like movies like P Mighty Peking Man. Like it had that same type of weird. Yeah. I mean, it, they definitely um, yeah. Queen Kong, Mighty yeah. Peking Man. Ape. This. <laughs> ape. Um, yeah. Ape. 
um, yep. stylized with the periods in between. Right. Um, yeah, they definitely are kind of all the same family In that tree. same box, yeah. Yep. Yeah. They all have the same end goal. I can't believe it's not King Kong. <laughs> yeah, like, right. You, know, I know. you order King wow. Kong and this is what you get. <laughs> you ordered King Kong. It's funny. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, yeah, this that, is an Italian-Canadian co-production. Um, what a weird... Our lead, <laughs> I guess, damsel in distress yeah is um from city of the living living dead and who was that uh, antonella was... interlanghi who oh, yeah. is in city of the living dead lucio fulci she's yeah. our main kind of damsel in distress that our titular yep. creature falls in love with yeah she's very young here she i think she's still a teenager uh, isn't it like um, the, isn't it like the, the the girl and her and her brother like it's like her like yeah the, the girl kids, and like... her brother yeah um, the creature yeah. is frozen in a block of ice. A businessman wants to use it to utilize, like to liven up his business. His yep. scientist friend tells him not to do it. Of course, they <laughs> <does capture it. laughs> transport the cre- creature to civilization. You yep. know the plot beats here. We've all seen King Kong. Right. And it's and like, I love how they transport the, <laughs> I love how they transport the Yeti. Like they put him like in like a box and like, and like have it hanging from a helicopter and they're like flying around with like. <laughs> yeah, like a helicopter could funny. even support that. Weight. Yeah, like like. But <laughs> this movie is so delightfully shaggy. It's kind of yeah, got everything you want in like a ripoff monster movie. Yeah, like no really one in the cool. film can decide how Yeti is pronounced. Yeah, Yeti, how do they say it? <laughs> Yerdy, <laughs> Yeti, because everyone there's an international cast. It was produced probably in two different sound stages. They're all different. They're all talking no one, different languages. Yeah. So everyone is just going free for all on the pronunciation yeah, of Yeti. That's funny. The monster is never the same scale in any two shots. Yeah, that's sometimes really Sometimes he only looks like he's about eight feet tall. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes he's, he's 50 feet tall. <laughs> yeah, sometimes he's stomping on cars. They like, never get the scale that? and the rear yeah. projection quite right. That's funny. The monster himself is obviously a man with some like fright wig and some makeup on. Yeah, he yeah. looks uncannily like Barry Gibb. I know, and I, I kind of thought he looked like a little bit like Jared Leto in some shots. I don't know why that. Where are they like that? <laughs> but he, 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 like, you know, like basically all he does is just like kind of like make like weird emotional faces, like, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like, weird emotional ple- faces. Pleading he kind faces. Of flips his hair like he's taking a glamour shot. That's funny. Ple- like he makes the like wig is like faces. blowing in the wind, particularly in the shots with the young girl, you yeah, know, with really the weird. damsel in distress yeah. that Nobody, he falls in love with. Yeah. And what really cracks me up about this film, even on the scale of other like King Kong ripoff kind of movies, is it never figures out if it wants to be like family friendly because your yeah, central you characters are a pair of children. A yeah, girl I mean, and a it's brother. like you don't know if what you're like, what, you know, just, I don't know. But what. On the, the other hand, like, you know, one of the adult male characters takes like a little too much of an interest in the teenage girl. At one point yeah. we learned that the Yeti is like into nipple play. Cause she brushes his oh, nipple yeah, yeah, by yeah. accident. That was and weird. they give you the reaction shot of him being way too excited what about it. What the hell it. was that about? That's what I was, I, I, think I was watching that. Know this. Like, yeah. I mean, He's you know, I don't want to yuck anyone else's yum, but I yeah. don't need to know the finish oh roadmap God. of like, that was a that, yeah, you don't see, you didn't see that in King Kong. You saw some other yeah. stuff. You didn't see him getting <laughs> like turned on and by I getting mean, his nipples. King Kong definitely yeah. runs with the undercurrent yeah. of that kind of. Yeah, you know, it is like that. I mean, it is like, you know, you, you can see him getting turned on, but like, it's just, just by basically he's just like looking at the girl or something like that, or, you know, maybe just holding her, but like the, the nipple yeah, thing, like, where did that come from? But yeah, we're, that's, rough, that's the Italian touch. You know what I mean? Like makes the Italian. fetishes really explicit. Yeah. Um, you know, you had to know this about the Yeti. It's important. Frank, Frank Kramer was like, okay, we need some uh, nipples in the yeah. show. <laughs> you know, whatever he would say. I don't know what he said. Yeah. Like, you know, there yeah. really, we <laughs> didn't need to know that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's never of... really sure if it wants to be like a sleazy exploitation <laughs> film. TMI, TMI, Frank Kramer, TMI. Yeah, TMI. Too much information about this damn yeah. daddy. I know, it's uh, one of those weird things. Yeah, it never is really sure if it wants to be a family film or an exploitation film. So it does yeah. a little bit of both things. Yeah, it was weird. And it kind of makes both worse and both sillier <laughs> in retrospect. Yeah, it is. It's just really strange. It, the, the tone because of it is it's hard weird. to take like the more straight up like adventure, like serious movie plot beat seriously when you pe- you have, you know, people. Yeah. Doesn't he, doesn't he like the dog about inappropriate yeah. things and a Yeti being transported in a little tiny glass box on box. a helicopter yeah. like that last yeah. scene in Willy Wonka? Yeah, right. It's it's that's what it looked like. It looked like that that like box, that like, weird like blue screen type thing where it's just kind of floating like through the air and like you don't know. Yeah, it's, it's undeniably not even goofy. It was um, really weird. 
And but, uh, everything yeah. about it is just done cheaply, done incorrectly. Yeah. Like at, yeah. at one point you have the typical miniature model. The Yeti is like throwing things. The next yeah. point you have a giant out of scale rubber foot, like stomping yeah. pedestrians to death. Right. It's just weird. It's just stra strange. Yeah, Everything it's is out of scale, out of time. And, you know, isn't even attempting to make any sort of procedural or like physical sense. Yeah. And, and, and uh, it's just good, silly fun. It right? is just a weird, like, you know, it's a good like Saturday afternoon, like wacky movie type thing to yeah, watch. Yeah, like for everything that wasn't camp about the yeah. shame of Patty Smith. Yeah, this, this one is, is exactly for every other movie on this list. Yeah. And if you watch this it, you'll is... know exactly what it is. What it yeah. Works. Cheerfully cheap, charmingly yeah. goofy, yeah. absolutely ridiculous, bad ideas, poorly executed in every <laughs> possible direction. Yeah. And it's a huge amount of fun. And I it feel is like fun out though. of the whole copyright infringement cinema, King Kong. Yeah. imitation trend cycle yep. maybe people don't talk about this one quite i wonder as much. what it, yeah i wonder what a, what the blu-ray will look like if it'll look like really really good i mean i sure i'm sure it will like look really good but i mean how it'll play like i have not updated this in my yeah. collection i think yeah. this one would actually in cleaning it up it'll probably reveal <laughs> the budgetary limitation oh, yeah that's true too you'll see like all the strings and every all the, bit of rear projection yeah. every yeah. out of focus right every yeah. you know Every, every odd every scale decision, rubber. every cheap rubber prop. Um, you'll, you'll be able to see the weird rubber red nipples. <laughs> oh, God. That, even Again, better. I just don't know why that needed to happen. But here it is. So you two now know it. That was such a weird movie. <laughs> but, I but it was, it was pretty entertaining. It's you know. a good movie to wrap the list up on. Because yeah, it's it is. silly fun. It is silly And fun. it is very camp. And it yep. is very cheesy and it's not something you have to think about. There's no deeper right. meaning here other than we were right. hoping to get some of that King Kong money. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um. <laughs> King Kong money. I know. It was, it was really one of those movies from that era, like where they, they were, it was, it didn't, didn't Dino De Laurentiis, like, I don't know if he like saw, well, he saw King, you know, he, he made King Kong. That's, that was something else. But I, I do like the, the uh, 1976 King Kong a lot. That was really, I like that more than the Peter Jackson one. I always say that I just like it better. I think it's better. Like, you know, I, I didn't like to honestly, I don't yeah. think his movie was much better than any of its imitators. Yeah. It just but had I, more I, production value. Yeah, it did. But I mean, I liked it. I just like it better than the CGI one that we that would Peter Jackson. I just like it much better. But uh, anyways, that's something else. But but yeah, yeah this is a good, silly fun. It's a yep. good monster movie time. Yeah, it is. Um, it cannot decide what it wants to be. And it's all the better mm -hmm. for it. It is yep. pure, unfiltered, you know, age cheese. Yeah, <laughs> that seems as good a place as any to yep. wrap up this tiny little list. Um, yeah. There was a couple was of a other list. films I wish I could have included. Yeah, but perhaps that's another day and another time. Yeah, tried to get something for everybody in there. So, you know, yeah, that's my little guided tour to forgotten and under discussed sleaze. That was a great little list. I, I liked it a lot. I mean, I, you know, I found most of the ones I watched. I really liked them a lot. So, you know, that was a good mix mixture of styles and genres and. Excellent. And I'm always full of recommendations. So if you yeah. want to come argue with me, feel free to come visit me at www.midnightmoviemonster.com. You yep. can also on Instagram or Twitter, I'm at Ms. Midnight Movie, all spelled out. Um, yep. You can come argue with me. You can tell me my yeah. taste is questionable because it is. <laughs> you can come, you know, I'll be happy to recommend you some more movies. Like come chat, come say hi. Yeah, that was that was great. So, I mean, thanks. Thanks for being on the show. And it was nice to finally talk to you after all this time. And oh, absolutely. Likewise. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it was it's great. nice to put a voice to, you know, the text. Yep, it is it definitely for both of us. And um, we'll have to do like our, our December, uh, like, you know, podcast. We'll have to do like at the end. I was thinking do it at the end of the month because I will have like a whole bunch of list of movies that we can re recommend that we watched type thing. Yeah, we can kind of do our favorites. Yeah, out of our the favorites marathon out of for December. Yeah, that'd be awesome. So, so, um, so thanks very much for being on the show. And, um, I guess we'll close it out. Uh, this is Pete Roberts, uh, 42nd street forever podcast. Uh, thanks everybody for listening and we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs>